to the vault, to the house itself. Oh, <laughs> Well, I got it. Okay. I'm going to call this uh, work session of the Salem City Council to order. And would the um, recorder please call the roll? Okay, sir. Present. Anderson. Likewise. Yankee. McCoy. Bosket. Coy. Here. Cook. Here. Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Okay. Small crowd. Do we have any additions? Second. Councillor Anderson, why don't you? Sure. Are there any additions to this? I don't think. Yes, there are. Are there? Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move the uh, additions to the um, agenda consisting of some written testimony on our green sheet here. Ah, okay. Great. Thank you. Somebody want to second that? Second. second. Okay. Hoy seconded that. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, I'm going to place public comment at the end of the discussion, at the end of the work session, so people can uh, see if any of their questions are answered or comments are answered, and then also be able to respond to any of the discussion of the pedestrian safety study, which is the topic of our program. Uh, Anthony, are you going to lead off? Uh, yeah, we're having a technical issue at the moment, but I think we're fixing it. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're on top of that one. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, my name is Anthony Gamalo. I am the uh, Senior Transportation Planner with uh, City of Salem Public Works and the uh, project manager for the pedestrian safety study. I'm uh, here today to uh, just talk briefly about the study and to in introduce our uh, uh, keynote speaker. Um, earlier today, we had a brown bag at, uh, at the Anderson Rooms in the library uh, to talk about this. It was open to the public. We had a really good turnout, uh, about 45 people. Uh, showed up and we had some really excellent feedback and uh, good questions to to add to our uh, to our findings and uh, to incorporate into the discussion this evening. Um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, just talk very briefly about the study. There will be a lot more uh, from our speaker. Um, there have been over uh, 300 pedestrian-involved crashes in Salem since 2011. And uh, in those 300 crashes, there have been 15 fatalities. Uh, six of those crashes, uh, fatalities occurred in 2015. Uh, this, was, this report is uh, a response to that spike in 2015 and the, uh, is really the, uh, the brainchild of uh, this council. Uh, in particular, I, um, my understanding of this predates me, Councillor Anderson has been a, a, a big advocate for this process, as is uh, Mayor Bennett, and we uh, thank you for your support on that. Uh, I want to introduce our, uh, oh, well, I'll start with uh, giving some, a brief overview of the recommendations from the study. Um, we, the city seeks to create um, walkable communities that consider the needs of all users. Uh, we believe this can be accomplished through the, uh, the, the so-called five E's, engineering, education, enforcement, evaluation, and encouragement. Uh, the report itself contains uh, approximately 50 recommendations to improve pedestrian safety citywide. Uh, some of those are citywide strategies, others are uh, location specific, and uh, they vary in nature. Um, more protected crosswalks, limited conflicts between uh, vehicles and pedestrians, uh, improved traffic signals, signage, uh, sidewalks, both uh, placing them where they don't currently exist and improving those that do exist and creating uh, those the connections or improving connections that are already there. And uh, uh, looking uh, especially at traffic calming where 
where opportunity provides and where appropriate. So to introduce our speaker, um, he, uh, Gary Schatz is a nationally recognized expert in transportation planning and engineering, as well as alternative geometric design. He's a frequent presenter at uh, professional seminars and contributes to national research of transportation issues with groups as, such as the Texas A&M uh, Transportation Institute and Turner Fairba Fairbanks Highway Research Center. In 2015, Gary started his own transportation consulting practice uh, with which he continues to advance the tenets of complete streets and context-sensitive, people-centric solutions. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for the evening, Gary Schatz. Thank you. Anthony, thank you, sir. Your Honor, Gary. Mr. City Manager, Councilors, thank you very much for this opportunity. We're very grateful for the ability to come to you and share some thoughts and ideas about what clearly is something uh, of grave concern to this community. Um, our team, uh, and I want to thank Anthony, uh, Peter, Julie, and Kevin, and also uh, Chief Moore and Chief Miller, who have been just instrumental in their help and their guidance to us, along with the other staff members. So I'm going to ask you to get grateful. a little closer to that mic. Or yes, sir, I will. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Very grateful for their, their guidance and their assistance with this project. As Anthony mentioned and we showcased at our brown bag, there is a significant problem. And people are getting hurt and people are getting killed, and it's just simply unacceptable. We had especially a spike in 2015 where six people were killed. Uh, the number of people being injured just continues to climb as well. These are staggering numbers in themselves, but when you look at them in contrast to what's going on in Oregon and then in the U.S., um, this is very significant. Uh, the city where I used to be, the city traffic engineer, uh, this even eclipsed it, and we were having 35 to 40 fatal crashes a year there. Just you know, a larger city, but the crashes per 100,000 is marked. So uh, this is an unfortunate uh, milestone that uh, Salem has reached, and let's see what we can do to reverse this significantly. Uh, looking at the averages, you know, people would say, well, on average we're doing okay, but as I said at the brown bag, you know, if you put one foot in a, bowl of the, in a bucket of ice water and one foot in a bucket of boiling water, on average you're okay, but that's not, that's not what we're looking for. So this is the, a map, it's a zoomed in on the, the core of Salem. There's still more crashes that have occurred outside this boundary, but this is where we saw a vast majority of the crashes occur. There are clusters, uh, there are um, you know, locations clearly where they need a little extra attention, a little attention to detail, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment from the findings of our study at a very high level. And then, you know, from the traffic engineering perspective, what can we do? But also, I want to have a conversation about um, there's some different thought processes as we approach public safety and, and safety of all roadway users. DKS, uh, who brought me in on this team, and again, I'm very grateful to Lacey and Scott for doing so, uh, took a look at 10 intersections, nine corridors, poured through tons of crash data trying to figure out is there a pattern and this crash data that we have is from ODOT so it goes through you know it's that that crash data is collected locally by uh, Salem PD and others and it's put in certain formats as we go forward so we're kind of dealing in some regards with uh, some some terminology that may be a little bit different and we'll talk about that in a moment but we're trying to look at all these physical details and also trying to look at some behavioral detail, details did some people make not quite the right decision? And by all means, this study does not seek to point a finger or place blame on anybody. We are looking to see what can be done uh, and what can we do better. So some key issues, we have a lot of what the term would be super blocks. Very, very long. There's not a protected crossing. And when I say protected crossing, I mean that the vehicles get a red light and the pedestrians get a walk signal. That is a true or, even, you know, even a stop, a always stop controlled intersection is protected to a point, but that traffic signal is what we consider a fully protected crossing. The rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which flash a, an amber, is just a warning. You know, you still are depending on the driver to stop for the pedestrian crosswalk, which is defined by state law. But those long blocks, people are just, that's too far to walk. 
and where I want to go is just on the other side of the street, so why can't I play Frogger? Or if I am mobility impaired or visually impaired, I'm kind of forced to go all the way down and come all the way back, and that's impacting my quality of life. So that's a concern as well. We see conflicts at the intersections of motorists turning, pedestrians already being there. Sometimes, you know, especially the right on red or turning on red, uh, I'm looking to the left, but my pedestrian is to the right. I don't see them until after I'm straightened out, and then that may be too late or almost too late. We do have some areas where we saw some street lights that need some work, but that's being addressed through the street lighting program. We'll talk about that in just a sec. But the aggressive driving behavior and some unsafe beh pedestrian behavior, when it's all said and done, we as individuals do have to make the decisions uh, based on the best interest of us. And sometimes that's clouded by, you know, sometimes it's impairment, sometimes it's impatience, sometimes it's just us not paying attention. So, you know, as much, as much as I would love to be able to walk and bicycle and drive for people, I gave that up a long time ago. It's all I can do to get myself safely down the street at times. But this, I, want, I do want to give kudos and, and point out the work that staff is already doing. They have a very um, decently funded street lighting program. They're moving forward to bring in LED technology to replace some of the older street lights, to improve lighting along the roadways. And it's request driven. We've shared with the community and they continue to share with the community. If there's a concern, please let us know. The sidewalk program the same way, about a million dollars a year that goes into it. Trying to move forward, getting in new sidewalks, replacing old sidewalks, even spot repairs when where necessary. But sidewalks are are not inexpensive and trying to wedge a sidewalk in between the utilities and the trees and the curb and you know people's picket fence and you know their landscape and all it can be very very challenging and that still has to match up with ADA criteria. The traffic signal upgrades what can we bring to the table with technology the accessible pedestrian signals uh, there's a picture on the slide basically it's the push button that talks if you push it it says wait and then when it says uh, walk sign is on to cross Smith and Jones, walk sign is on, 10, 9, 8, 7. So you give the same message to a visually impaired person that a sighted person would receive. Uh, those can also be applied at the uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, except they won't say walk sign is on because there is not a walk, but it can say lights are on. Because all the lights of the RFB are on, you do still do not have the right of way to cross with impunity, somebody still has to stop for you. Um, traffic calming I think is a very important program. I think we can be very clever with that. Uh, there's already traffic calming efforts. There are things that can be done along some of the higher level uh, streets, maybe the collector level. It's a little bit different. It definitely involves a conversation with uh, our partners in fire and life safety. So we have to balance uh, emergency response times with uh, speeding mitigation. And it's not simply putting up a different speed limit sign. Because people travel at the speed they feel comfortable traveling based on what they perceive. Uh, the area corridor studies are continuing and city is also participate, staff is also participating with other programs such as the school side assessment committee, the intergenerational walking project, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. I saw a presentation that was, I think, shared with y'all earlier in the year and I'm taking that back. I, I want some people to see that. That is just fantastic. So congratulations on that. Uh, we're looking at... Um, doing what's called leading pedestrian phases at traffic signals. Right now, the driver gets the green light and the pedestrian gets the walk at the same time. We're changing that in some locations where the pedestrian gets to go first and the driver has to wait. That gives the pedestrian a chance to get out in the crosswalk, be a little more visible, so that when the driver does go, they can see the pedestrian. Uh, the RFBs we've talked about, there's about eight of those in, more coming. Uh, we have some double right, double left turns that really make it challenging for pedestrians to get across the street. So where traffic loading will allow, um, staff is looking at taking those out, making them single uh, lane left turn turns instead of double. 
The pedestrian refuge median islands, there's about 25 of those. I think those are fantastic. Those are pretty easy, relatively low hanging fruit to do. If you have a, a median or you have some width to the roadway that you can introduce that refuge just to break those crossings into a two step crossing, um, a great thing to do. And I, and I applaud you all for doing that. The school zone flashing beacons, of course, and we have some driver speed feedback signs. You know, it's said that if you have to put up a sign that says you need to slow down, then we need to take a different look at the roadway design. And that is true. We, we do acknowledge that a lot of our roads are pretty auto-centric in their design. They go through some very people-centric places, so there is that mismatch of functionality. We can do what we can through retrofit, but a lot of that may need to be addressed through uh, redevelopment and reconstruction to really get the roads and the adjacent uh, land uses to really agree on their, fu their functionalities. Salem PD is doing a ton of stuff. Speed, their enforcement campaigns, they've done I think 78 so far to date. They work very hard to partner with the citizens. They're out there. They're, they're the eyes and ears and uh, law enforcement cannot do what they need to do without the full cooperation of the citizens of the community they serve. So I cannot stress enough how important that is and, and uh, we definitely are grateful for their service as well. We're also looking for, uh, they, they work with public works hand in hand, so where can we make improvements? So staff is doing a lot of things to, to try to address a lot of this, but clearly there's more that needs to be done. Some of our recommendations, we talked about these long super blocks. Where does it make sense to add mid-block crossings? Clearly, if I have an apartment on one side of the road and I have a transit stop on the other side of the road, that's a desire line and people are not going to walk all the way down, come across and walk all the way back. Uh, you know, I look at the, the fabric of a community kind of based on the size of its downtown grid, which uh, in this case is about 400 feet by 400 feet. That's kind of the, that's kind of the basic building block. So you know, a thought process is as we expand further and further away from the core, is there a way to somehow keep that building block in, block in place when we look at crossing opportunities? Granted, there are things that make it challenging to do from a technical standpoint. You know, if we have continuous driveways, we have some places where the frontage is nothing but one long driveway, or we have driveway after driveway after driveway. You know, those can be challenging corridors, really, really auto-centric. Where we can limit conflict between pedestrians and turning vehicles, I think that's a great way to do it. Again, if I'm turning <coughs> right, I'm looking left, and if someone is crossing to my right, I do not see them until it's almost too late, or it may be too late. So another thing, you know, where, we, where can we improve intersection lighting with uh, street lights, supplemental lights? Uh, really, and, and this, was, this, this graphic points to what I just said, at the planning level, how can we do our land use plans a little bit different? How can developers come to the table with something a little bit different when we do a traffic impact analysis? Is it a multimodal traffic impact analysis? Okay, you've told us how many cars you need to have coming and going and how many parking spaces you're supposed to provide. Where are the pedestrians coming and going? Where are the cyclists coming and going? Where are they parking their bikes? Are those safe? Are we doing those things that encourage bicycling? Are we doing those things that encourage walking? through our design of our, of our sites and our development? The answer is we can. And then, you know, we still have the concern of driver and pedestrian behavior. And it was a point that we heard at our brown bag today of how do we get the word out to people that they need to slow down and pay attention. You know, they need, you know, here are certain laws. Now, granted, some laws may work better than others. You know, for example, you know, there's, there's Oregon state law that says, under these certain conditions, uh, a pedestrian is, is behaving illegally to be in the roadway, but you know, at the same time, there's not a, quote, jaywalking law in, in Salem. And you know, that, that, I can argue that point both ways, because if I have this big, long super block, and again, I have the apartments on one side and the, and the um, transit stop on the other, but I have a jaywalking law, I, have I really done anything to help or have I just, you know, created more conflict and more angst as opposed to let's provide a safer crossing and then maybe if there is a jaywalking law, maybe it applies to where, you know, if you have protected crossings that are 400 feet apart or less, no, you need to go down to the protected crossing. But if the protected crossings are a quarter mile or more, 
you know, we, uh, that's just a law that that's just a, a conversation that I would suggest the community have if there is a look at a jaywalking law. Uh, here's an example of uh, driving through and kind of an application of what we've been talking about. You know, this is State Street where it, you know, if you're, you know, westbound, you'd have the hard right and everybody goes around the block to, uh, to uh, tell me again, I'm sorry. Court, Court. thank Court. you so much. Um, and I noticed driving through there one morning that there was a person in a motorized wheelchair wanting to cross going from right to left in this image. And the vehicles were coming at this person mm -hmm. from the blind side. And this person actually had to pivot their power chair, maybe their head wouldn't turn so far, they had st trouble with their neck, to see oncoming traffic. And you've got to pivot far enough that your both eyes can place can be placed on the vehicle approaching, otherwise you don't have depth perception. Because if I turn my head and this eye is blocked with the bridge of my nose, then I don't have the same depth perception as if I can turn further and put my eye on it. So this is a challenge. Uh, so what could be done here? Well, one idea is create a mid-block crossing along uh, 13th Street. So you go up about up half up way between uh, state and court and you cross and you come back. That's about 400 or more feet. Okay, well that's a city block, and that's off the desire line. What is the likelihood that people are going to do that as opposed to cross there? Maybe not so much. What happens though, if we take a look at this intersection from the standpoint mm -hmm. of making it a protected crossing? So it is a traffic, it's a signalized intersection. But the important thing is it wasn't signalized for motor vehicles. It was signalized for pedestrians. And it's one of those things, you know, we have a various number of manuals in my profession that say you've got to have a certain number of cars doing this, a certain number of pedestrians doing that, a certain number of crashes of this type, and then you can warrant one of uh, a, a traffic control device. Actually, you know, the, the city traffic engineer, we in the profession, we do have the ability to exert our professional judgment and say, I understand all that. It doesn't meet any of the warrants. But you know we have a repressed latent demand. I can't get it, I can't get the numbers counted to cross because they can't get the gaps to cross. And then you know you get out of the chicken and egg by saying you know based on engineering judgment, this is a very people centric place. We're putting a signal here, and it's just you know it's just that com that level of uh, comfort and that and that level of support from this body as well, because on the other side of the coin, if everybody wants a signal everywhere. I, I think Public Works will want a little more money than they get, please. That's my plug for them. So some specific site recommendations where, we're, where we studied and we're seeing the crashes. Lan Lancaster Drive there between Devonshire and Center, three enhanced mid-block crossings, looking at where we can restrict some of the permissive left turn phases. Uh, so if a pedestrian call comes up, you don't get a permissive left turn. You get a, you know, the, you'll have to turn on a green arrow, and you don't get to turn until the pedestrian is clear. You're giving me the look. Let me go back over that. Okay. If I pull up to an intersection, and I, I want to turn left, and I get a green ball, that means I may turn permissively, assuming I have a gap to do so. Or if I get a flashing yellow arrow, it means the same thing. So you won't do that if someone's crossing. You won't. Yeah, you, won't you won't get a green ball or a flashing yellow arrow. You'll keep you'll keep either a red ball or a red arrow. You will not be able to turn. Gotcha. That's the idea behind it. Thanks for the look. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> That's a. I, I get into my jargon and I forget, so I apologize. Pringle Road, uh, it doesn't feel very good to walk along, especially at night. There's, we st really need some street lights out there, some mid-block crossings, and Pringle is one of those roads that really you could do some innovative things with traffic calming. Now, I'm not saying necessarily speed humps and speed tables and speed cushions, but other devices that could slow uh, the traveling the vehicles down. But again, that's an important conversation to have with fire and life safety to make sure we're balancing their needs with, the, with all the other needs that need, that road needs to provide. Liberty and Ferry, uh, a challenging one. Uh, one idea we came up with is maybe there's a pedestrian only phase there. And otherwise it's a scramble. All the vehicles are held, but pedestrians can cross across, diagonally, whichever way. The challenge is it does take more time to do that. And this is the intersection that the core of downtown is timed off of. 
So, you know, Public Works is going to have a, a challenge if that's done. What you do here is going to ripple out to all the other signals in the downtown core and maybe even beyond. So we need to be careful that we don't create a domino of, uh, of work with that. Uh, curb extensions are probably still a good idea. There's some there. Maybe we can get a little bit further out. Again, restricting the left turns on red. And then uh, there's still the conversation of closing that west crosswalk. It had been closed and it's opened back up. Maybe it's closed again. But again, here's that desire line. You know, how do you balance all that? And then River Road near Del Mar there at the Fred Meyer, you've got all this residential area to one side of the street and there is no way to get over to Fred Meyer and a lot of people cross there and they play Frogger to do it. So can we add a couple of enhanced mid-block crossings to help them do that? And then uh, on a programmatic recommendation, I wanted to suggest what I'm terming a safer crossings program. It is, it's actually defined, it has um, uh, certain criteria, annual process, request driven. Someone turns in a request, it goes through objective and transparent eligibility and ranking for funding criteria. And then you know, it's evalu evaluated by that criteria. If it makes it through evaluation, then it's designed based on that criteria. And then it's funded for construction based on that criteria. So if I have 50 requests come in and I only have staff ability to look at 20, okay, which 20, which 20 and why? And then if 20 go through and I only have staff ability to design 15, okay, which 15 and why? And if I only have money to build five, which five and why? And anybody at any kind can say, please tell me the status of my request. Here's the report and here's why you ranked where you are and here's why you're higher or lower or whatever. And I think that helps everybody because then we all know what the rules are. And it's more, it's more objective than subjective. And again, it's transparent. Funding clearly from the city of Salem, but you know, what private developers are out there? What entities are out there who maybe want to develop adjacent to some of these sites? Uh, other public agencies, ODOT, uh, schools, etc. You know, who could partner? And partnerships, we think, are critical. The day of where a single public entity can bring all the money to the table, I think, are almost gone. But if everybody can bring a little bit of something, not only do you have the money to do more things, but you have that collaborative effort on the front end. It's kind of like the old parable of rocks. <coughs> the other thing I would suggest is uh, taking a look at putting together a vulnerable roadway users advisory committee. There is language in or Oregon statutes that talks about vulnerable roadway users. This aligns with that. So pedestrians, bicyclists, people on skateboards, visually impaired, mobility impaired. And you know the vision for it is streets are for people. And this is, this is where we as a community begin to think really, really differently about safety. Because I would submit to you that streets are not for cars, they are for people. And people will use a street based on their needs, based on their means, and based on the context of that street. I-5 is built for people. It's built for people who need to travel by long distances at speed or haul freight at speed over long distances in cars and trucks within a corridor that will allow them to do so safely and efficiently. So whether it's I-5 or it's a cul-de-sac in a neighborhood, they're all still built for people. Now I'm not saying that we're going to put crosswalks on I-5, but if we're thinking about I-5 as a linear corridor, could we put a shared use trail over at the far edge of the right of way? Or where, you know, I 5 is a linear barrier to this community. Can we create ways to better poke holes through that wall and make it a little more permeable for cyclists and pedestrians of all ages and abilities? Uh, and again, you know, this, this, this committee is not necessarily a new committee. Uh, there are some committees that are in place, maybe just. Uh, you know, a, a rethinking of their scope, maybe combining some committees, maybe reformatting some committees makes sense. But, you know, definitely look for those collaborative partnerships with community stakeholders. And this committee is, are the folks who help inform that program criteria, the processes and the metrics of that Safer Crossings program. There's a ton of amazing talent in this community, in all communities, that can really help us on the transportation engineering and planning side of the equation better address issues and concerns. And then, you know, they're also their role is to share information recommendations with this policy body on what might be done. 
So a couple of policy recommendations I want to share with you. Uh, currently in one of your adopted transportation plans is a goal of zero pedestrian fatalities by 2030. Expand that to zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2030. Again, it's a mindset. So I'm here from Houston, so the Houston Astros, you know, I'm real, we're real excited about them and that community really needed that after the effects of Harvey. We needed a win. But if the Astros had not gone to play with the mindset of we can win the World Series, they would not have won the World Series. So I think we in the transportation profession and we suggest to our communities, if we come to the table with yes, we can do something and let that something begin with me, then we can begin to change the conversation and not say, well, yeah, people get hurt and it's too bad. No, people get hurt and it's not acceptable. Uh, again, we're needing, there will need to be identified and established some dedicated funding streams. And I know like you, like all other policy boards, are very adept at finding new funding streams, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, and, and we would also recommend adopting a complete streets policy. And a complete streets policy says that any street or roadway we design will be designed for all modes, regardless of age or ability. Now again, that is the caveat to that is context. I-5, I'm not going to design with sidewalks along the shoulder, but I can put a shared use path out to the side. But a local street, what can I do differently? And sometimes it may be that you have a local street that you just aren't able to get sidewalks in, but that may be okay if the street can be designed such that it is truly a shared space. And whether you're a pe pedestrian or a motorist or a bicyclist, all of you have parity in that space. Another thing we'd recommend are looking at adopting the best practice documents and guidelines that are out there. There have been a ton of these in the past 10 years that have been vetted at a national level, endorsed by Federal Highways, AARP, uh, and many other organizations uh, that are really encouraging people-centric planning and development. What can we do? It's not looking through the book and finding a picture that matches and said this is what we're doing. And getting the drawing is drawing parallel lines and you know putting little cor corner radiuses on. Uh, I want to share real quickly what we heard at the brown bag discussion. Uh, Anthony mentioned we had about 45 people there. I, I can't say thank you enough. That was a wonderful crowd. They had great input. They were very concerned. Uh, we, we heard a lot of good things. A lot of it involved this happened to me, helped me understand what happened and what could have been the, a different outcome. Uh, but you know, also, you know, what are the traffic laws? There's some confusion out there about traffic laws, and how can we get that education out there? And you know, tra traffic enforcement versus education campaigns. And uh, the chief was quick to point out that you know it's officers' discretion, but if there's an opportunity to educate, they would rather educate than uh, go through adjudication. And that's far better to get people to do the right decision on the front end instead of have to talk through it in, in a courtroom. Again, the driver education, and I, I'm a personal advocate of every time you get your driver's license removed, there ought to be some kind of test. What are the new laws? Uh, just what a refresher on the old laws. But I know that has budget implications for DOTs and departments of public safety and et cetera, and people, oh my God, I don't take tests well, or I don't want to go through that. I mean, it's a community, huge community discussion, but again, something I would suggest. Otherwise, when do we learn about new things? We kind of don't. Uh, and then speeding concerns, and I think rightfully so, because uh, speed does kill, and we know that uh, a pedestrian struck by a motor vehicle traveling at 35 miles an hour has a 60% chance of being killed. Unfortunately, we have very good data. If that vehicle's going 30, then that chance drops to 40, so it's better than 50-50. And we know those numbers are higher for children and the elderly. So speed is a huge thing, but again, it's not just putting up a sign. And it's not just enforcement. It's truly changing how people perceive the roadway. It's changing attitudes. It's changing behaviors. It's a whole lot to it. If it were as simple as putting up a sign, we could go home and put a sign on our fridge wanting our kids and our spouse to do exactly what they want to, and they would. <laughs> Tell me how that works out, please. Didn't work in my house. With that, thank you very much for your time. And uh, questions or comments, please. Any questions? I'm, I'm going to uh, let you know we have three people signed up to speak on this as well, three members of the public, so just keep that in mind as you look at the time. Councillor Lewis. Yeah, um, just one comment. I, I didn't see it anywhere in the report, but the idea of using cameras for uh, initially education and ultimately enforcement, 
final mention of that? It wasn't part of our scope. The, the scope was to look at here is the crash pattern. Uh, what are some things more from the engineering side as opposed to the enforcement side? Okay. Uh, if I could Oops, sorry. more. Um, you mentioned at the end the, the, the value of education and a, a driver's test every time you renew your driver's license. Are you as animate about education for pedestrians and bicyclists? I think education for everyone is important. Okay, thanks. Now how you get pedestrians and bicyclists into that test, I do not know. Councilor Cook. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I wasn't able to come to the brown bag, so thank you for coming. And I'm really glad to hear about the ease that the city's currently using. Of course, you know, for safe routes, we're still missing the encouragement piece and the equity piece. And I have to say, in reading this report, I kept asking, you know, yes, we want safer environments, better access to more destinations, opportunities to be active, but what was the viewpoint of the study? and who was missing from the table because there really was no mention of equity, um, whether it be from you know pedestrian bikes, drivers, or across the ages, like you were saying, it was really just general. But I know when we talked before the session, you said you were given a very specific scope with this study, and it was just to really look at these patterns and analyze them specifically, not in general based with the population, is that right? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Yeah, Mayor, if I may, uh, uh, Councilor uh, P Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. <coughs> The focus of the study was we had that gigantic spike in pedestrian fatalities. And we had written a staff report to council uh, a year or so ago that spoke to uh, what, uh, what was the incidences. A lot of incidences were, were due to uh, driver under the influence. Uh, in some cases, unfortunately, the pedestrians were also uh, under the influence. Uh, but we didn't want to dismiss the uh, you know what had happened and simply say, oh well you know they were wearing dark clothes and they darted out and that's it's you know it's their fault or you know give give the driver a break. We really wanted to to dig in and see at these locations what's going on. So the scope very specifically was look at these locations where we've had fatalities and tell us what we're not seeing, and that was the the focus. As the study evolved, we thought it'd be a good idea to bring in uh, Gary to kind of provide the community with a broader view of, of what's happening. But, but the study was never intended to, to be a transportation study or a ped safety study. Uh, we did an update to the, to the bike and ped plan in the, in the transportation system plan uh, a year or two ago that was adopted by council. We have a lot of projects and a lot of, uh, a lot of good things that, that now they simply await funding, but, but very specifically, this was about the locations where we had fatalities and what could we do to address those those kinds of issues at those locations and in general. Thank you, Director Fernandez. And make no mistake, I'm very happy that the study was done. I still feel like it left some points on the fringe that it alluded to. And I know you talked tonight about these um, high priority areas where you have housing on one side or um, businesses on the other, how we design our communities. And when I looked at these patterns, I could see a reason to cross. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept kind of putting these down. Also, in reading the report, road rage continued to come up, um, being a cause for aggressive driving. And as much as Councilor Lewis was talking about education of pedestrians, education of cyclists, um, it would be interesting to look at uh, aggressive driving or dangerous driving um, through the enforcement aspect as well. I mean, of course, we already have speeding. And as you mentioned, enforcement is only one side of the equation. <laughs> uh, but being able to look at that piece as well. I was happy to hear you bring up the best practices. I noticed you put a roundabout up there a few places and the protected crossings with medians. Um, I, it would be interesting to look at the cost savings. My husband was stuck in traffic today uh, with, well, he was part of the traffic while they were redoing the light. Um, uh, the signal was going and he said, you know, it was just red and nobody knew what to do. And I was like, that is not a good sign because you, you should know what to do and the signal should be <coughs> helping to facilitate not, not becoming a problem. Um, one thing that was missing, and I know that this started in May, 
school arrival and departure times, some of the biggest um, employers in our city are schools. And I know as a parent, when we have spring break, traffic's totally different than when school's in session. So just being mindful of that, I know the peak started at three and then finished at five and then came back down and the assumption is, well, everyone's off work. But as someone with littles, I'm like, oh, well, we've all left early because we're coming in at six and now we're picking up kids and going home. So taking that into account as well. Um, you, you did mention the vulnerable roadway users and the zero traffic, but no mention of Vision Zero. What were your thoughts on that for recommendation? With complete streets and Vision Zero being complementary, you would widen that Vision Zero to also include vehicle instances, or I be, it turns out that sometimes when we when we bring forth the concept of Vision Zero, it's not well received on the front end. Uh, it varies from place to place. I brought it forth uh, indirectly through the changing of the language from zero pedestrian to zero traffic fatalities and injuries and that is the language of vision zero all right even even in my own profession there's some people who scoff at it because of, oh you know we'll we'll never stop all the crashes people will continue to make bad decisions etc and i and again that goes back to that mindset uh, okay people are going to make bad decisions what can we do? Uh, there was an unfortunate crash, uh, pedestrian fatality, where the individual, unfortunately very inebriated, passed out in the roadway and was run over. Well, maybe that's not an engineering solution, but it sure could be a conversation about mental health. It could be a conversation about substance treat abuse treatment. It could be a conversation about what can we do to help on the social side of the equation. It's not always engineering and education. Sometimes what can we do on that other side? And you know, you mentioned equity, and I'm glad you did. Uh, that that committee that I suggested could include that as part of the conversation. So all things considered equal, if we have a certain request, we'll go where there is a need for equity. Uh, that could be a prioritization factor. Where I've been before and we've had environmental justice areas defined by our MPOs, we have a ranking for funding score that counts whether it's in or out of an environmental justice area. So we're looking at are we have low to moderate income or are we have no sidewalks on either side of the street or no sidewalks on one side of the street contiguously. So I think there are ways to get to that. And I think also, you know, I talked about partnerships we're seeing great partnerships with the, uh, the medical industry where they can bring us data that has been appropriately scrubbed so it's, we don't get in trouble with, with the HIPAA, HIPAA Act <coughs> that can say here are where our emergency rooms are, are getting patients from in terms of crashes. The police were never called, but the kids were still hurt nevertheless. And that was information that was brought to me by a children's hospital where I was previously. I didn't ask for it, they brought it proactively. I couldn't have been more thrilled. But they also gave us clues where to go do education for proper child restraint, for handout helmets for bicyclists, things like that. So there's a lot of good data. We, we need to find some new and innovative partnerships. And I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Com I'm going to have uh, yeah. Councillor Anderson now. I, I'm sorry. I want to make sure we have time for oh, yeah, public absolutely. comment. OK. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mayor. Um, I was at the presentation, as were you this morning. So thanks again for both presentations. Um, and, and I'm cognizant of time, too. So I'll just say that I was the one who submitted the additions and um, additions to the meeting tonight of the uh, 15 pages of, of what breakfast, uh, Salem Breakfast on Bikes had to say about this program. Um, I, I, if you could respond to that, not right now, I want to make a couple comments, but I, I gave it to Mr. Schatz right. after, the, after the presentation and asked him to look at it and so he would have time to give us some comments. Um, I'm very interested in the traffic calming issues and I see the speed, speed humps, the issue with the higher level streets, I think median islands are a traffic calming thing. And also, I don't know, I, it was either Dan Burden or Chuck Moran called, uh, called it interrupting horizons. I don't know the exact word, but you don't want to look like you're going down a, a, a speedway. Um, finally, I like the recommendation, not all, penultimately finally, I like the recommendations of um, 
the traffic, zero traffic facilities, and I've been talking, uh, 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 fatalities, I've been talking about the Z Vision Zero from the beginning. The policy and what I think now is going to be called VRUAC, V-R-U-A-C, uh, I think that would be a good thing. Um, finally, I, uh, 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 this is all going to have to be a budgetary process thing. We're going to have to look at this, and so I'm concerned from the city manager's point of view that the budget process is coming up, and some of these potential recommendations we're going to have to look at through the budget process. And then as a last point, you know, I look at this and I say in some ways we're looking at this through the wrong end of the telescope, and the real issue is speed, 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 um, not pedestrians being someplace. I've heard a lot of people talk about this, and I've yet to hear someone say, gee, I want to be able to move my car faster through downtown. So if you could respond to the Breakfast on Bikes. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you again for your leadership on this topic. Uh, I think a lot of what was said in the blog made sense. I think I, I read a lot of frustration because, indeed, uh, there has been a continued, and I'll admit, my industry is guilty of it. You know, we've been pretty auto-centric in our thinking. And to be able to have a more people-centric viewpoint of it. And, you know, again, you know, that's why I mentioned speeding earlier. You know, just to put up a sign, just to say the speed limit is now this, does not necessarily result in a change in driver behavior and say we'll just go out there and write more tickets doesn't necessarily result in that change of driver behavior to the level that we would like and it be sustained. I think that, uh, and that's why I also catch the, converse, the, the comments about the jaywalking law. I think to say it's illegal to jaywalk period, I'm, I'm not sure that really, I think that misses the mark because if, again, if it's a quarter mile between crossings or I want to walk from my house across the street to my friend's house, I mean, I don't want that to be considered jaywalking, but I'm in a totally different context there. So I think, you know, in, in some cities I've been in, the jaywalking law has applied to, like the downtown core where and where there is not a protected crossing within certain some certain distance. Or, so that if it's a half mile away, okay, it's not jaywalking. If it's 100 feet away, okay, it is jaywalking. So, I mean, that's the conversation that can be had. Um, but, yeah, we, as we, we do this paradigm shift of going to more people-centric, uh, and, you know, the counselor mentioned her husband being stuck in traffic, there is going to become a trade-off. And here's the question. Will you trade motor vehicle level of service for multimodal quality of service? He was stuck okay. because they were repairing a red light. Okay. <laughs> Great. I, I have a lot of people who said, yes, we want it safer, but don't slow me down. Um, no, we're fine. So that, that's, that's where we in this profession are, are we're, we're kind of being held by our shirt collar and yet pushed from behind to do something. Well, thank you very much. This is really a good presentation. Appreciate it very much. We're going to let the uh, members of the public that wanted to comment, and then we'll see if we have a little time for some more questions. Bob Courtright. Three minutes, please. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Bob Courtright. I live in West Salem. I spent my career working on land use and transportation issues. Um, I did have some comments on the study. I want to say the report is good as far as it goes. Up to the mic. I'm sorry. In terms of the recommendations that it provides you. But the scope of the analysis that's been done as part of this study uh, and the recommendations that it provide really miss the issue of speed and driver behavior. Yeah. Um, I asked about this in the meeting this morning and apparently looking at speed as a factor in crashes was not a significant factor in this study. It wasn't done because there wasn't uh, the budget to do that. But I think that is really missing an essential issue and uh, one that the council should ask be addressed in revisions to this report. Let me say a little bit more about that because 64% of the crashes, pedestrian injuries and fatalities, are related to driver, what we call driver behavior. And I think you can pretty easily connect the dots between driver behavior, which is failure to yield to a pedestrian or fail to, failure to obey a traffic signal, to drivers going too fast. The faster we go, the cone of vision narrows, the likelihood that we're going to see a pedestrian or have time to react. Uh, is reduced, the likelihood and severity of an injury will significantly increase. So it's pretty easy to establish, and national studies establish this, that speed is really an essential thing to address. 
Uh, there was mention of Vision Zero. A fundamental principle of Vision Zero is you need to slow vehicles down if you want to re improve safety and reduce fatalities. So um, five specific suggestions for you to think about as this report goes forward. First, I noticed that this report uh, was produ produced as a final uh, and there wasn't a draft. I think that's unusual. Um, I hope you'll be able to, to look at revisions to it. First, there should be more background information or analysis of the problems that are associated with speeding of the kind that I, that I just mentioned. Uh, second, the report should be amended to include a summary of the available data about speeds. Uh, there is information from other studies that have been done in Salem. For example, in the Salem Breakfast on Bikes, you see that speeds on commercial are 10 miles an hour above the posted speed. There should be a key finding in the study that says speeding is a problem and that we need to address it. We need a, a citywide strategy to do that. And one specific countermeasure that we should look at in addition to the ones that have been mentioned, like the message speed message sign boards is visually narrowing, or I'm sorry, narrowing the lanes. Again, the streets are designed in a way that they tell us how fast we ought to be driving. We need to think about ways to redesign streets so people feel comfortable driving at the appropriate speed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan Meyer. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors. I'm Alan Meyer. I live at 4545 Sunland Street Southeast in Salem, and I'm the uh, Transportation Chair of the Morningside Neighborhood Association. We wanted to be here, uh, and thank you for having us go second, because many of my questions were answered. Oh, good. But we, we were approached in September, a month after there was a traffic fatality on South Commercial Street, and we were asked to support a uh, signaled pedestrian crosswalk in the area where that happened. And while that was emotionally appealing, some of us said, wait, what is the justification for doing that? There were some testimonials, but there was no hard data. We had no idea how many people crossed at that location. So we asked the city to bring us some data. So at our meeting this month, they brought us some data, which to me weren't all that convincing in terms of numbers, but, but maybe they were, we don't know, because we don't know what the data was for other alternatives. All we knew is 28 people per day crossed here. What about further up commercial? What about on other streets? Uh, we don't think the policy should be that every time there's a fatality, that compels us to take an action at that location. If that were the case, looking at this study, we would have had a lot of signaled crosswalks throughout the city of Salem. So I was very happy to hear that you're looking at objective and transparent eligibility criteria. So if someone could come to us and say, here's the need here as compared with the need elsewhere, would you please support this? We would be more than happy to support it. Those criteria exist for speed bumps, I know. We get requests and there's a prescribed procedure that Kevin Hotman has given me and a process for going through the, the <coughs> gathering the data. So we know it can be done. We're hopeful that it will be done in this case as well. Great. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Meyer. Uh, Scott Schaefer. My name is Scott Schaefer. I'm the vice chair of the Morningside Neighborhood Association. I live on Forsyth Drive in South Salem. And uh, I'm also the president of my homeowners association. And several years ago, in our neighborhood, there were some neighbors who requested speed bumps. And just to echo what Alan was saying, um, there was a study done. The request has declined. And although people were upset about it, they accepted it because they understood that there was a process in place. And I think what we noticed when this uh, proposed crosswalk on Royvon and uh, South Commercial was proposed to us as a board is that there really wasn't a process. It, it seemed as though the decision was being made first and then the process was being invented to justify it. And I think that can oftentimes lead to some pretty poor decisions. So as a board, we decided not to take a stand on the actual crosswalk itself. What we did is we wrote a letter, or an email I guess, uh, recommending that uh, a process be developed by which to vet these things so that you know we can come up with some clear answers. Our biggest fear is that these things will pop up all over town but they won't be put in the prime locations to protect uh, the safety of the people crossing in, in the best way possible and that it'll lead, lead to uh, traffic backup. So 
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We've got five minutes left. Yes, Councillor Cook. Question for Director Fernandez. What's the uh, wait list time or wait list number for lights and sidewalks? I know you keep a list and then a part two addendum. I know there's some who owns the lights because I've called in out lights and it's, oh, we can't do that. Someone else has to fix it. Could you just explain? Right. So, <clears throat> so for sidewalk, uh, uh, <laughs> For sidewalk repair, it's endless. <laughs> so, I mean, as, as, as the council knows, uh, there's uh, the need is gigantic, and the resource is what it is. So we're so I can't I can't Not tell you. Not repair, but gap. Oh, Wait it really gap? depends. Uh, for gap, uh, it it really so uh, it, it it depends on whether there's money or not. I mean, there's no program to install new sidewalk other than when we have how many people are on that a, list. A, a, I, I have no idea. Okay. I, that's yeah. I mean, the the locations are uh, there, there's there's numerous okay. where, where where there's gaps on street lights. We do have a program because now there's dedicated funding. Uh, there is a uh, I can't tell you the you know what the timing is, uh, but there's a list 40 or 50 uh, locations or, or neighborhoods and uh, criteria that council adopted uh, after a recommendation from a uh, from a group of citizens. And there we are uh, starting at the top. Uh, we already have some projects uh, coming up. I think they're in uh, they're in uh, East Salem, and then we're also uh, uh, plucking from the middle of the list, so the the onesies and twos, the, whatever rises to the top of the ones and twos, are also being funded, so that the large projects and the very small ones both get get uh, kind of an equal footing. So that's that's the way we're working the uh, the request for streetlights. Thank you, Director Fernandez. Uh, so I just want to say, really quick, simplest truths are the most important. You should be able to get your mail. You should be able to walk to school. You should be able to cross through a parking lot and not have to worry about taking your life into your own hands or being in violation of a law. You know, we talk about the crosswalks. My mailbox is on the other side of my street. So that's how it works for me. Okay. Uh, I had uh, one question. Uh, could you uh, perhaps, uh, as we move forward on this, uh, uh, responding to a comment from uh, Councillor Anderson, which I think, uh, and one of the recommendations, take a look at the role of CATSI and uh, whether or not that could be used. Uh, it's got a fairly, because of what it works on, which is stop signs and speed bumps and uh, all kinds of other stuff, could we be expanding their role to make that a more meaningful committee? In fact, that's where we're headed. When, okay. when, when Gary had that recommendation, uh, we said, well, we're not so sure that we want any more yeah. commissions or or councils, but we have CATSI that could that uh, really at this point is is a little underutilized. So there's a yeah. there's a great opportunity for them to advise us on uh, on, on these additional things. Well, I'm hoping we'll get a recommendation that uh, allows uh, allows us to like take a look at the makeup of CATSI and look at possibly expanding it to pick up on the various equity and uh, stakeholder issues Absolutely. that I think have been raised. Absolutely. Councilor Anderson. Director Fernandez, Katsy, Citizens oh, Advisory. Sorry. Wait, I think I got it. <laughs> Citizens Advisory Traffic okay. Committee. Safety Committee. <laughs> well, there's no S there's in no Katsy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we ought to add that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Cat C, not Cat C. Yeah, C. Yes. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> just quickly, Mayor, um, uh, this has been a very interesting discussion and, and helpful, but my question now is process. What happens next? And I guess I'm pointing to asking you and also the deputy city manager, what's next? I, I think you can count on this being part of the budget process okay. and part of the implementation of the strategic plan, which I think speaks to uh, the kind of issues that have been raised by council t tonight. And uh, we'll have an opportunity, I think, both uh, uh, categorically as well as systemically to look at this. Uh, but keep all this in mind as we look at the budget um, so that uh, you're ready to make the real hard choices because there are hard choices to be made. Okay? Great. Well, thank you very much and we'll adjourn this work session.
City Council Urban Renewal Agency to order. I do want to make sure that if anyone wanted to testify, the sign-up sheets are over here in case you wanted to sign up to testify on any items on uh, either the Urban Renewal or City Council agenda. <clears throat> okay, you want to call the roll? Board Member Kayser? Present. Board Member Anderson? Likewise. Board Member Nanke is absent and uh, Jonathan Baker is serving as guest counselor. Yes. Board Member McCoy? Here. Board Member Austin? Here. Board Member Hoy? Here. Board Member Cook? Here. Board Member Lewis? Here. Chair Bennett? Here. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, with one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Mr. Baker, welcome this evening. Look forward to hearing your questions and comments, but we don't want to see you trying to vote. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the urban renewal? Okay. Any public comment? Nope. Uh, no one has signed up to address the uh, urban renewal agency. Did anyone want to speak to the urban renewal agency? Okay. You want to move the consent calendar? Can I move approval of the consent calendar? Second. Second by Kayser. Any discussion? It consists of the September 11th uh, URA minutes uh, and the October 23rd uh, urban renewal uh, minutes. Very good. Anyone want to debate that one? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Information reports. Who's our information reporter today? Anybody got any questions on any of this? It's the purchases, the administrative purchases. Okay. That'll be it then. We have no special orders of business, no public hearings. Urban Renewal Agency is adjourned. Call the Salem City Council meeting for November 13th to order, if you would call the roll. Councilor Kayser? Present. Councilor Anderson? Also. Councilor Nanke is absent. Uh, guest Councilor Baker? Here. Councilor McCoy? Here. Councilor Osick? Here. Councilor Hoy? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. Councilor Lewis? Here. And Mayor Bennett? Here. Okay. Additions and deletions? None? Okay. Uh, any council or manager comments? Councilor Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to say, and I'm sure this is true for all the council, and it should be true for everybody in the city, we passed our library bond uh, by a very overwhelming margin, 64% in uh, Salem for Marion County and 55% for Salem in Polk County. And a lot of that is due to uh, the hard work of the council in coming up with the right amount and the staff in coming up with the right amount to assist us. But it's also due to the Friends of the Library and the Library Board. And I specifically point out the Friends of the Library who were in charge of the campaign. There were two co-chairs. One was uh, Jim Shepke, who did a whole lot of work on this. Um, lots of innovative um, ways to uh, uh, canvas people, uh, which I and I know other counselors did too. And also uh, Judy Martin, who was the co-chair. And both of those people did a terrific job. And as uh, people of Salem, we should be proud of the work that they've done. And we should look forward to a new library that will be um, retrofitted to seismically perfect, uh, protect people in the library and we'll also, we're going to have uh, oh, the HVAC and the roof and other things will be done to extend the life of the library uh, for all people of the city of Salem. Great. Thank you, Councillor. 
Councillor Hoy. I would just like to underscore what Councillor Anderson said and also uh, put in a plug for perhaps when we have to look for a temporary home for the library that I know that there's a wonderful location in East Salem, uh, formerly known as the Book Bin on Lancaster and I'm sure we would be uh, very happy to to uh, host the temporary library there with the, in, in hopes of potentially having a, a, a future library at that location. So I'm, I'm very pleased that the bond passed and uh, I think we should all be proud of that. Very good. Anyone else? All righty. Mr. City Manager, okay. No proclamations, no presentations, public comment. Okay. Steve Anderson, there you are. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I've been here several times to speak before you, but I want to speak tonight in support of the Mayor's uh, asking for a creation of a task force to deal with congestion or on the bridges. That's 17-544. Spoken several times as co-chair for the Neighborhood Association as a public citizen saying that by small and simple steps do good things come to happen, and we see this as a very positive step. We thank the Mayor for this action and support it. Just a couple of points to illustrate why this is important. I went back to my notes a long time ago when I was a young PhD student. My friend who was the uh, dean of the business college, uh, Covey, Covey Business College at Utah State said, you really need to expand your look out of science and you need to take an MBA as a, uh, a minor. Interesting experience, but I was, that was when I was introduced to Peter Drucker, a famous management consultant, and he said, on the issue of change and solving problems. He says the first step is we need to determine what results are needed. And I think this is a good first step. He says we need to change our habits, not our culture, but we need to figure out what we want to accomplish and why we want to do it. So thank you, Mayor. The second one that illustrates this point, I've got some time real quick, was we climbed Mount St. Helens this summer in August during that week of hot weather. Usually at elevation, it's cool. I was in shirt sleeves sweating like crazy. And the point here is that we kept looking at the summit but we make little goals, because we had to go up a certain way, hike for 15 minutes or so that last 2,000 feet, stop, hydrate, rest, and then pick a new goal. And this is point here, is that as this task force moves forward with small goals, the ultimate goal is to have circulation in the whole community, and we think it's a good idea. So thank you, Mayor. And then finally, as a point to the budget meeting, this is a good chance to revisit Marine Drive as local access and circulation in part of the resolution. And finally, I know it's a council committee. I've served with several of you on citizens committees and as advisor, I would think maybe it might be worth adding somebody to represent the general public. I've worked with you, Councilor McCoy and others, Councilor Lewis, and uh, I got a plenty on my plate, but I would be happy to provide some expertise as a citizen member to help provide a little balance to that. So again, support 17-4544 and say thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, Councilor Lewis. Yes, Councilor Lewis. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for coming down. Um, it's my understanding that the geographic parameters of this uh, task force on the west side of the Willamette River will go as far north as Orchard Heights. Are you suggesting we look at Marine Drive from Orchard Heights south? I think so. I think we need to look at Marine Drive because we were here before the Planning Commission and. Public Works traffic engineer did a very good job in that discussion, but the planning commissioner asked him, do you have any mitigation for traffic on Wallace Road right now? And he said no. Marine Drive is one of those mitigation options that I think needs to be included in this process. We talked at the budget committee about postponing that expenditure, and I think this is a good time to take a hard look at that with recommendations to council, how to extend Marine Drive, right of ways, purchase, where we lay down asphalt. I think that's part of the solution, and I think it should be included, Councilman Lewis. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you very much. Herm Bowes. <clears throat> good evening, Mayor and uh, staff and councilors. It's good to be with you tonight. I just wanted to come tonight and encourage uh, maybe our <coughs> counselors a little bit in regards to the homeless issue in our community. It's uh, quite an issue of topic. Um, 
had some good articles in the paper recently, and uh, the mayor's done a lot of work in trying to uh, make awareness of the homeless in our community. And so um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and, and share with you. I do have some information sheets. I don't know if the council would like a copy of them. There's some providers in the community that provide, okay? Some providers in the community that uh, help serve the homeless in our community. And one of the things I would like to encourage you to do is get around and stop in and visit some of the providers in our community that are serving the homeless, that are serving those who are in poverty, so that you have a firsthand experience of what is going on in the community in regards to homelessness. Um, I know before I became involved with any homeless issues, my view of what homelessness was was totally different than when I began to meet some folks who were homeless, when I began to interact with some of those who were working with people who were homeless and came, came to understand some of the ideas and some of the uh, things that were going on with them. And so my encouragement is get out there and meet some of the folks that are walking on our streets, that are sleeping on our sidewalks, and that are um, struggling with housing in, in themselves. <clears throat> I was interested recently, I went to the Marion County Reentry Initiative and enjoyed listening to Janet Carlson's story about the lady that she was helping. And one of the comments she said was really fascinating where she said that uh, she learned more by working with that one lady about mental illness, and I'm gonna maybe put in homelessness, I don't know if she said that, but she learned more by working with one person than she did in school and teaching and in being involved with, um, uh, as a, as a um, what is she? Commissioner. Commissioner, there we go, losing the words. <laughs> and so if you would, um, stop and visit a shelter, um, have lunch with some folks who are uh, uh, having, uh, having a meal, and get to know some of the folks that are struggling, trying to find a place to live. And I make myself available. If you would like to help with making those connections, I'll be more than happy to go with you and introduce you to some folks and let you get to know some of the folks that are trying to help those, but also some of those that uh, are just uh, struggling from day to day. So thank you for the opportunity to come. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, the information I have here is not complete, okay? The, the, the things on the form that I get, have here for you, those are just ones that I know about and that I work with. There's lots of other ones that uh, are involved as well. So if I can be of any help, please let me know. Thank you very Thank, much. Thanks, Herm. I want to uh, second your uh, suggestion. I had the opportunity on uh, Veterans Day to go to Home for Heroes with Senator Ron Wyden and visit with uh, part of the veteran, homeless veterans that are housed there and listen to their stories. And it, it was uh, uh, very uh, telling and, and informative and moving. So I think the suggestion is a very good one. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. Uh, thanks, Herm, for all you do. I, I, I'm going to say that um, this probably is incomplete. One of the things that I think this community needs more than anything else is, <clears throat> excuse me, those that are willing to help all of these organizations work together on one cause as opposed to independently. And um, I see you helping with that. I know a lot of people look at these organizations as being in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. They are not in competition. They are serving together. And they often collaborate together. And I know the new facility Community Action has. One of the goals they have for that facility is to bring a variety of, of partners together so they're all in one place. So that when someone who has an issue, they don't have to go away, all the way across town to deal with that issue. The helpers will, will be right there for them. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jan Kaiditz? There you are. Mr. Mayor, City Council, hi everybody. <laughs> Again, thank you for listening to our concerns tonight. Be sure to say your name. Jan Kaidatz, 3797 June Avenue, Northeast. Okay, thank you. But thank you everybody. <laughs> I want to, um, one of the things I do want to thank, uh, my husband and I, the police. They have been so good at answering all our 911 calls. They have been wonderful, and we really appreciate it. 
One of the officers, I wrote down his name, Officer Beal, B-E-A-L. He has been oh, absolutely wonderful <laughs> trying to get the homeless not camping there and the semis on the street. It's been wonderful. He's, he, he's trying really hard. It's not like I'm not social. So I'm, I've known a few of the officers and I really appreciate it. And then another good thing, the last time we were here, October 9th, um, the guy from the bank came next door and he did take the garbage out of the back. He made several trips, I might add, in a big flatbed, a big one. But he still hasn't uh, cut the grass and it's about five feet tall in the back now, but there's a shed and people are going into the shed. And it's happening. Yes, the tree's fallen on it and it's not in good shape. But anyway, so that's our concern. I mean, my husband goes and he checks every day. That's our protection. I don't want any of that around. And I mean, I stand out in our, our garden on our side of the fence with a phone in case I need to call the police and stuff to just make sure there isn't anybody there. Because one of the things the police didn't even know, the, a mall across the street from us, her first day on the job, her first 10 minutes on the job, there was a homeless sleeping on the bench in front of Ross's dress for less. She wanted him to move. He pulled a knife on her. She didn't call the police. She called the company. And I'm going, police would have been here in 30 seconds. <laughs> That's who I would have called. But anyway, so we're, we're scared. The, 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 these kind of people are, are not good people to have around, and you don't know anymore. There's knives, there's guns. It's scary now. It's scary. But I, you know, I, I don't know what else to do, but uh, one of the things, Scott was here last time, but he couldn't attend the meeting tonight, but he brought up a proposal that if we could have no camping signs on coral, we are all tired of picking up their buckets of solid and liquid waste. They leave it where they park, and when they take off, it's all there, and they're garbage. We don't want any of that stuff around. We're not gonna let it sit around. And, and stuff, so we're, we're doing the best, but we just wanted to come another time and, you know, please, pretty please. Great. I'll quit. Thank, Thank you, you, Jan. Norm? Uh, yes, Mayor, I'm members of council. This up. Uh, yes, so okay. uh, we do have a couple of updates, particularly on the Coral Avenue property. Uh, first of all, we've been in contact with the custodial company that is uh, managing the cleanup of that site. And as of Monday of last week, we are still awaiting word on a bid that has been approved to have the grass cut, as well as a bid that has been approved for a contractor to remove the shed. So the, both those items have had forward progress of some sort, but we're still awaiting word through the custodial company on the contractor to uh, to schedule that activity. So uh, the. The officer for this particular case, Nelson Morales, will uh, be in contact uh, with the surrounding area and the neighbors that have been affected as soon as we get better information as to when those contractors will be mobilized. And, and we're putting pressure to have that happen, correct? Yes, sir, we are. We're putting the best pressure that we can short of uh, any sort of immediate citations. We're seeing good progress, and so uh, we're withholding the citations uh, at this time since uh, it appears that this should be complete by the end of this week or next. And the no camping signs, has there been any review of that by you or Public Works on that, or you? You, you may recall, uh, Mayor, members of council, that we had an ordinance before you a few months ago regarding camping and other activities on the sidewalk, and that, that wasn't uh, adopted. So there is no current prohibition on, on camping in that area. Oh, Councilor Hoy, did you want to comment on that? Uh, I wanted to comment on something else. I had oh. understood the Sitlai ordinance was specifically about downtown. Coral Avenue isn't anywhere near downtown, if I'm not mistaken. It's out in my work. Actually, the ordinance so. wasn't specific to downtown. Right, but the focus was the downtown core. So, that was what but I wanted to most chat of the with attention. Mr. I had to actually wanted to compliment Mr. Wright and thank you for your work you've done on this issue. I know after the, the, the folks were here last time, you, you personally went out to the property, you visited with your staff, and so I just wanted to thank you for all the work you've done out there. And I, I think it's finally, these folks are seeing some relief, and I think you're seeing it in their faces and hearing it in their voices, and I just really appreciate that work, and I hope that we just continue forward with that uh, 
and, and not stop until we get this problem solved. So thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Gary Kiditz. Do you want to speak, Gary? No, I think I'll withhold until okay. next time I come. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope this doesn't happen again, huh? And we can't thank you. Uh, oh, it's, it's been over a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's your thank you, Norma. Good yes. one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Pete Dane. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Pete Dane. I live at 720 Capitol Street, Northeast. Uh, and I'd like to uh, make some comments on the uh, third bridge issue. Uh, last Saturday at the City Watch meeting, uh, Bob Cordwright, who's an advocate of no third bridges, gave a presentation. And he uh, discussed uh, modifying the, the routes over the bridges to improve uh, traffic flow. And it seems like a cost-effective way of at least temporarily improving things. And one thing he didn't mention was any contingency plans if there was an earthquake or another disaster and, and how to deal with the bridges shut down. And it's something maybe to keep in mind. Another practical solution for preparing uh, the bridges for the future, come what may, is if they were um, if they were retrofitted for uh, earthquakes, and if those uh, items uh, for contingency plans and earthquake retrofitting were done first, it would be uh, help improve the situation in the near future, and then maybe sometime down the line when it's really needed is. Uh, uh, reconsider the third bridge issue. Anyway, those are my comments, and does anyone have any questions? Well, good news, Pete. We're, we've got a uh, uh, project underway with ODOT to uh, reinforce the Center Street Bridge for earthquakes. The Marion Street Bridge just uh, won't make it. And we'll also uh, I'll have a motion tonight on dealing with those additional uh, improvements at the existing bridges to try to uh, improve the congestion there. And we do have contingency plans for emergencies uh, using particularly the railroad bridge uh, under various types of emergencies for emergency vehicles. So I think we're, we're kind of starting to answer those questions. So thank you very much for bringing them up. Okay, well that's good news and thank you. You bet. Okay. That's all I have signed up under the con under public comment. Would anyone else like to address the council? Okay, we'll move on then to the consent calendar. So Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second by Hoy. Uh, the items on the consent calendar tonight are uh, first the um, uh, city council minutes for the October 23rd meeting. Uh, under action items, under 3.3A, we've got uh, uh, approval of a retail lease <coughs> in Liberty Parkade, um, Suite A with Feinstrasse LLC. Uh, under 3B, we've got an approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Marion County, uh, whereas where we will uh, have that agreement, Marion County will uh, design and uh, expedite the uh, traffic signal interconnected project in a variety of uh, uh, areas of the city, uh, the biggest being uh, from Silverton Road to Kaplinger Road, uh, by near uh, uh, along Cordon Road. Um, we also have 3.3C, where we're going to authorize the Salem Depart Police Department to add one administrative analyst to position, allowing the department to address staffing shortages of sworn post <coughs> police officers. Police officers by having that that uh, new position assume the uh, uh, training, uh, uh, managing training duties, and taking the sworn police officer we have now, put him on uh, a, a patrol duty. And then we have 3.3D, uh, which is also an inter um, intergovernmental agreement with Marion County for mobile crisis response team services, where uh, the police department is going to assign uh, one police officer that will work with one health, mental health uh, person um, to deal with 
uh, issues that arise when we've got folks with mental health issues uh, getting involved in the, w with the police. Uh, we will uh, enter into an intergovernmental agreement with Marion County where Marion County pays for the co pri cost of that police officer so we can provide that service for the next couple of years. Something we've been doing for three years, I think. Yeah, right. And that is the consent calendar. Any uh, questions or discussion? All those in favor of the consent calendar, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We'll go on to public hearings. The City Council will, will conduct a public hearing concerning approving the vacation of Frontage Road Northwest and Paradise Court Northwest subject to the conditions that the petitioner provides easements for utilities and public access and pays an assessment of special benefit. The criteria applicable to proposed amendment is SRC 255.065B6. Testimony must be directed toward the identified criteria or other criteria the person believed persons believe to apply to the decision. A failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. The hearing will be conducted with staff presentation first, followed by other interested persons. Neighborhood, neighborhood associations are limited to five minutes per association for testimony. Individuals testifying are limited to three minutes. A yellow light will appear at the podium when one minute remains. And a red light will appear when your time has expired. Please conclude your testimony when the red light appears. Very good, thank you. And we'll start with the staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, my name is Julie Warnicke, Transportation and Planning Manager in the Public Works Department. I'd like to start by entering the staff report into the record. Capital Manor LLC filed a petition to vacate Frontage Road and Paradise Court Northwest as shown in the crosshatch on attachment two of the staff report which is also on the screen. These streets currently provide access to over 30 separate lots. Let's see if I can highlight there. Um, all of those lots are currently owned by Capital Manor. Paradise Court is developed with curbs and sidewalk most of Frontage Road has pavement but does not have curbs or sidewalks. The vacation also includes a portion of Frontage Road that was previously vacated in 1981. And so this is the section that's shown in the darker crosshatch. Back in 1981, the vacation had reserved an easement for utilities which is no longer needed. And so that's why this is being included in this petition. Capital Manor is requesting this vacation in order to accommodate redevelopment and expansion of their facilities, including construction of a new memory care facility, which will be located over part of Frontage Road. So to facilitate the, the redevelopment, Capital Manor is proposing to consolidate their lots into three larger lots, shown here in different colors. As you can see with this slide, the right of way, existing right of way, um, does not need, meet the needs of their redevelopment. So I'll go back here. This is the redevelopment concept with the three lots. There's the right of way that's proposed for vacation. The partition and redevelopment process are closely intertwined with this vacation. The vacation requires that the existing lots have access, while the partition and redevelopment process is complicated by the location of the existing right-of-way. To address this need, staff is recommending that final plat approval be a condition of the vacation. In this way, we can assure access to the existing lots while also supporting redevelopment. The staff report addresses how this proposed vacation with conditions meets the criteria for approval. Let's see here. Not sure you can read this, but this is in the, in the staff report. To summarize, staff recommends that council approve the vacation subject to the following four conditions. First, final approval of the Capital Manor partition plat. 
Second, provision of an easement for utilities over the right-of-way proposed for vacation, excluding the area that was previously vacated in 1981. Third, that the petitioner maintain and pay ongoing expenses for the three street lights on Paradise Court that will no longer be in public, um, on public property. And fourth, that the petitioner pay an assessment of special benefit in the amount of $240,969.16. And uh, the details of that valuation are uh, included in the staff report. So that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, that's quite a precise number. What, uh, <laughs> it's, it's based what on a per square cents? footage, oh, and I, I thought about rounding it, but then I couldn't really come up with a justification other than it would be easier to say. So it's based on the square footage, based on kind of, can you explain what that formula looks like? The, the, you know, the formula, so we uh, worked with Urban Development, with Clint Dameron, Real Property Services Manager, to come up with a valuation um, by square foot based on the values of adjoining properties, the value for Paradise Court, and the value for Frontage Road were slightly different. Um, we then applied that uh, by square foot to come up with a number. Now we are recommending reserving an easement over this area and so with that requirement we reduce the assessment by 50 percent. Okay. And so that's how we come up with that precise of a number. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be asking you questions. Yeah. Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that number just caught my attention. I, sorry. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, is there a representative for Capital Manor who will be? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council, staff. You have how many minutes? Oh. And do it a little bit more. Ten minutes. Ten. Oh, I have ten? Yeah. Go for I'm, I'm not prepared that long. <laughs> Don't need it. I'm David Lewis. I've been privileged to serve as the executive director at Capital Manor for a little over six years. I would also like to welcome a cadre of residents who have come in support of this as well from Capital Manor. And um, so appreciate their being here. I want to thank the staff of the city. This is a very complicated expansion. We are building a memory care unit. We're also adding um, and changing the plat, and you've seen that. They have just been incredible in working with our architects and developers and board all along the way. We do very much appreciate their hard work. City has been supportive of Capital Manor now for over 54 years, and we appreciate that relationship. We have read the conditions that the um, staff has put on there. We believe we understand them, and we accept all four of them. And so it is our request that this city council would approve this vacation and um, allow the residents to begin to receive some of the memory care, not the ones here right now, but um, <laughs> to receive the memory care that they need to have private rooms. We also have done an independent study and realized that we're not meeting the needs in Salem. There are people that want to come to Capitol Manor that are on a waiting list and we've been full for two and a half years. And our waiting list keeps at 45 different numbers. And so we would like to be able to do a better job of meeting the needs of senior adults in Salem area. That's our primary market area. We tend not to pull from long distances. And so I have brought, and we have developers, we have architects, and we have engineers. So if the council wants to ask some really technical questions, we have experts here. Okay. Councilor Anderson. Thank you very much for coming here, and thank you all folks from Capitol Manor for trip, or taking the trip down here, too. Um, I asked uh, Julie Warnicke to put up the map there because uh, I'm just a little curious as to where you are planning to build the memory center. I mean, it seems to me that you're not going to destroy the units that are there. You're probably going to build it by the parking lot, what well, looks like just, or is that it? That's yeah, the yeah. proposal? Okay. You see where Julie, that's, that's right that. on the end of the current memory care. Okay. Does that help? 
Yes, it it's does. It's got to go there and then kind of toward. So you're going to add on to, to what's there now. Okay, yes, now sir. I understand. I, I thought it was a separate one. That's 34 um, independent living areas plus all the amenities. Okay. Then the um, some of the right of way that you're asking us to vacate, it's really just. It's on paper. It's not really there going, uh, yeah, thank you. Is, is that whole thing from the cul-de-sac down, that's there now? And so what will happen is the, uh, the, uh, the bottom half of the, the vertical line is going to be gone. You're not going to, are you going to use that? And the top half will still be there because you need to get into those homes that are there. Yes, Julie? Well, I think that would be. Um, it's up to you. It's up. It's up to them once it's vacated. Okay. Yeah, it okay, is. Thank you. They will have to, you know, because we are requiring an easement be provided. Uh, we recognize, and they recognize that there are some existing utilities within the right of way that will need to be relocated, um, and then have easements provided in their new locations. At that point, the easements. That are no longer needed can be quit claimed. Okay. Any other questions, Councillor Lewis? Uh, I think it's more of a comment. I, um, uh, David, I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing for the residents of uh, West Salem. I think it was about a year ago you warned me you'd be here, and uh, and the day has come. I think that's great. Um, the fact that you are. Um, satisfied and, and mentioned that you understand the four conditions really brings me a little bit of peace of mind and so uh, congratulations and continue thank you yep. <coughs> sorry you're adding the paper figured it was about time to get signed up though it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we, we will have a call to you in in the morning in sir the morning. <laughs> <laughs> great thank you very much Uh, Joseph Alderman. No, you didn't mean to be on this one. Uh, no, I did. I just, uh, You're okay. Okay. Uh, Chuck Archer. Uh, no comment. All right. <laughs> uh, Michael Poisson. No comment. I'm good. You're good too. Well, everybody's good. Wow. Okay. Right. Any questions for staff, Councilor Lewis? Yeah, um, I'm going to bring this up anyway. The, um, the ordinance SRC 255.065B7C says that the council may, at its discretion, require a, a petitioner to pay an assessment in an amount deemed by the council to be just and equitable. And, and I, I get the idea where um, the city put the streets in, uh, it caused an expense, it's not going to be used, we should get paid back. Um, I, I get that, and I, and I think there's been some reduction in what the arithmetic would have pointed out. But in a case where we are fulfilling one of the greatest needs in the city, um, every dollar that they spend on fees is a dollar they don't spend on the need. And I just... I guess I'm looking for some historical justification for this charge. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one if I, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Salem Hospital paid a million dollars for their street vacations. Uh, Willamette University paid hundreds of thousands for their street vacation. So, so it's been a long, the, the council can make uh, the decision, it's ultimately a council uh, policy decision, uh, but the, historically the policy decision has been uh, to charge, uh, to vacate, and, and the basis of the policy is if it were the other way around and we were acquiring that right of way, we would pay probably significantly more than that. So that's, that's the, the policy basis. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. This is sort of uh, following up to Councilor Lewis on a different angle, though, and I guess I'm going to look at uh, Clint Dameron. 50% for an easement? Uh, uh, how did you get at that uh, amount as opposed to 25% or 75%? And is the amount of $240,969.16, Ms. Warnicke, is that? <laughs> Is that the 50% value? 
I believe that's correct. Julie can so, reiterate. Yeah. So how did you get to 50%? What made you, what is the easement for and why is that well, it's, reduces the value to them of 50%? It's the rights reserved in the easement are for utilities. They basically cannot do a whole lot with that land, even though it's vacated. Because we you might have to go in. It, you can't um, okay. you know, provide anything else other than maybe surface access across it. So. All right. So the easement really doesn't uh, uh, allow them to develop to any great extent. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Councilor Lewis, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, I move a staff recommendation. Second. I'm a close hearing, and then you're moving that staff recommendation. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay, our next okay. public the hearing. The City of Salem will now hold a public hearing for the purpose of hearing an appeal of planning administrator decision approving a 20 lot phased subdivision on the north side of River Road South, located at 3906 Cordell Drive South. The criteria applicable to the decision are SRC 200.025D and E and 205.010D and .015D. Testimony must be directed toward the identified criteria or other criteria the person believes to apply to the decision. A failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by other interested persons. Neighborhood associations are limited to five minutes per association for testimony. Individuals testifying are limited to three minutes. A yellow light will appear at the podium when one minute remains, and a red light will appear when your time has expired. Please conclude your testimony when the red light appears. Very good, and we'll have a staff report. Uh, thank you. For the record, uh, Christopher Green, planner with the Community Development Department Planning Division. And uh, here is to this present. your first time here, Mr. Green? This is, yes. It is. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to point that out to the council. <laughs> so this is a uh, city council review of a uh, consolidated case for a subdivision, uh, a uh, phase tentative subdivision, and an urban growth preliminary declaration. Um, so the tentative phase subdivision plan, it's a uh, 20 lot subdivision for uh, to be developed in two phases. Uh, the subject property is a little under five acres. Um, and then the urban growth preliminary declaration is um, a review that um, helps ensure that adequate um, facilities and utilities are put in place uh, for lands that are being developed that are outside of the uh, existing urban service area. And this is a uh, review of a planning administrator decision issued September um, 29th, the original decision uh, approved the proposal with 17 conditions of approval. Uh, so the subject property is in the far southwest um, part of Salem. This is kind of a distant view of it. It is on the north side of uh, River Road South. Uh, zooming in a little bit, uh, this is at the uh, basically the western edge of an area that's been developed with single family homes over the years on the north side of River Road South. Um, there is land to the north and the west that's still inside the city um, that's been developed over the years with uh, lots that are typically about five acres and contain a single uh, residence. And then uh, on the south side of River Road is the urban growth boundary, so um, agriculture mostly to the south of that. Uh, so taking another look, this is an aerial photo from around 2014. The subject property there is in highlighted in light blue. So um, it has frontage on River Road South. Um, it is uh, just to the east is the Bailey Ridge subdivision. And then there's a, a single family residence that was constructed in 2013. And that's uh, on the north side of the property um, and then largely vacant between that residence and, and River Road. Uh, so again, it's a, a phase subdivision, uh, two phases. Uh, phase one on the south, coming directly off uh, River Road south with a, 
um, street extending north in a, in a cul-de-sac. Uh, and then phase two uh, is in the, on the north side of that property, so that is um, an additional nine lots. There'd be 11 lots in phase one. Uh, some issues that were raised in comments. One was um, traffic safety. Um, there was a kind of a variety of comments related to traffic safety. There's a few factors um, in, on this um, subdivision. One is that the uh, north-south street is actually right on the property line. It's a three-quarter street, so it is um, basically as far west on the property as it can get to maximize intersection distance. Uh, one condition of approval requires a left lane coming off, a uh, left turn lane coming off River Road South um, to the new street. Um, there'd also be frontage improvements required on River Road and um, a condition requiring an engineered study that would have to demonstrate that um, site distance requirements are met at that intersection that would be created. Uh, and then uh, many comments um, raise the issue of connectivity across uh, phase two. So um, there is a rather recently constructed residence on phase two and if that um, in the meantime between phase one and phase two or if phase two weren't developed, would this cause a gap in connectivity? Uh, there's a condition of approval that area in purple is the right of way area that would be required in phase two. Um, so a condition on phase one would be that at that time they dedicate uh, the right of way for these perimeter streets in phase two to ensure that access uh, is continued through. Um, so staff's uh, recommendation is to um, approve the consolidated application as um, as a uh, as approved on <laughs> September 29th um, with the 17 conditions that were included in the original decision. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to take questions. Well, I have public comment and then ask questions, so thank Thanks. you. Uh, Joey Shearer. And Mr. Shearer, you'll have 10 minutes. Thank you got a short presentation. I probably won't need all that time. So good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Joey Sher. I'm a planner with AKS Engineering and Forestry, consultant for the applicant. Address is 4300 Cherry Avenue Northeast, Kaiser. 97308. And I would like to begin by thanking staff, Mr. Green, uh, for his communication and assistance throughout this, this project. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for the uh, opportunity to, to be here this evening and, and tell you a little bit more about what I think is a, a great project. Um, like I said, I'm going to keep the presentation short. Um, because the application materials staff report go into much greater detail and then any questions uh, that you have for staff or for myself, I'm happy to try and answer those. I also want to make clear um, that the applicant generally agrees with the findings and conditions uh, in the staff report and the, the staff decision. So a quick overview of the site. As Mr. Green said, it's just under five acres. Uh, it's currently zoned RA. Upon platting of the subdivision, the zoning would automatically change to RS, so the plans are all uh, designed around the RS zoning. And it's uh, 20, 20 lots, so 20 lots to meet or exceed city standards for, for future detached single family homes. This is a, a phase subdivision, and some of the comments that we saw that came in to the city, um, I don't know, reflected some, some concern or some question about what that actually meant. So the phase subdivision, it allows for an extended approval time. It provides the property owner with additional flexibility. Um, but as such, each phase must be substantially and functionally self-contained and self-sustaining. That's 
language in the code itself um, related to, to public improvements, and that's to make sure that each phase can stand alone and that each phase works together uh, as part of a whole. So water, sewer, stormwater, public streets, all of these ha have been designed so that phase one is self-contained con and self-sustaining, um, but those things will integrate seamlessly into phase two if and when construction of phase two gets underway. Um, an example of this is an issue that was raised in the public comments uh, related to connectivity. And as, as staff mentioned, the staff decision conditioned um, condition number eight, the dedication of land for, the, for street A and the first street right of way uh, with the phase one plat. And essentially what that does is it establishes public access through the property before the first home is even built. This slide is related to condition 14, which was also mentioned by staff. Uh, it's an exhibit of site distance standards at the intersection of Street A and River Road. Uh, one of the concerns raised in public comments was the safety of traffic from Street A or, or even actually Tayside Street um, pulling out onto River Road. Condition 14 requires an analysis demonstrating that the intersection of Street A and River Road meets the intersection site distance standards. What this shows is that at that intersection, you have site distance of 430 feet to the west and 500 feet to the east. And per AASHTO standards, the site distance on a 45 mile per hour road would be 360 feet. So this, this is, exhibit shows that there is plenty of site distance at that intersection. Um, and so that standard, that standard, that condition uh, would, would be met. And furthermore, Salem Fire Department and Public Works each reviewed the application and did not have any concerns with the safety or function of its design. So to summarize, this project provides certain benefits to the community, provides needed housing, 20 lots that exceed or meet city standards for detached um, single family homes. Street improvements. Half street improvements along River Road with an eastbound left turn lane and an enhanced public street system including sidewalks and landscaping strips. Infrastructure extension, uh, eight inch sewer main in River Road extends all the way to the western line of the subject property and a 16 inch water main um, also in River Road extending to the western line of the, the subject property. And of course SDCs. So with that, uh, I would restate that the application and plans provide substantial evidence that the applicable decision criteria are met. We respectfully request that the City Council approve the application. I'm happy to try and answer any, any questions. Great. Thank you. Councilor Hoy. Can you describe in more detail the improvements to River Road, specifically not just on the side of the, of the road that uh, this development is on, but on the, uh, the opposite side as well? I can, and those are shown in a little bit more detail in the plans, which maybe I've captured here. It doesn't show the full dimension. Um, but essentially, to River Road, what you have is River Road is designated as a minor arterial in the TSP. And right now, uh, I believe there's a, approximately a 46 foot wide improvement within a 72 foot wide right of way and I think that improvement width might might change a little bit. Um, and what's being proposed here is to dedicate um, land equal to the, the 36 half street for public right of way and construct a 23 foot wide half street improvement along the entire property frontage. So um, curbs, gutters, sidewalk, um, paving, the, the whole half street improvement. On both sides of the of River Road? Um, no, just on the development side of River Road. My concern gets to the, I mean, I'm a frequent cyclist in that area, and mm -hmm. the, I know the, the other side of the road is quite narrow, and I'm just concerned with increasing the traffic there, increasing the number of cars, and not improving the, uh, the area uh, on the other side of the road is quite, quite concerning to me. 
<laughs> well, generally, those improvements would be required when property on the adjacent side would be um, would be uh, developed. Um, until then, I think there's there's generally problems with proportionality of requiring a full street dedication um, for development of property only on on one street. <laughs> Thank you. I knew somebody needed to give me permission. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, like Councilor Hoy, I'm a frequent uh, bicycle rider along that road, and it is a bad road. But I tell you, Councilor Hoy, I hardly ever go that way because I used to go by Riverdale Road, which is. Uh, I try to avoid Riverdale. Yeah, well, I think Riverdale's a better road. But my question is we can have that discussion after the meeting. Cycle race. Yeah, 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 there will be. There will be. I'm a little confused as to where the the purpose of the left turn lane on River Road. Is it for cars coming off Street A to go north on River Road, or is it for cars coming off River Road from the south going left, or both? Good question. So it's an well, eastbound left turn lane. So it would be cars traveling eastbound on River Road, uh, being able to slow down and turn left into this project, not obstructing the, the vehicle okay. flow. Well, well, I would, okay, not, that's good, but I would also s guess there's a problem. Most pro street cars coming off Street A are going to be going north on River Road. And so they don't have, they just have to turn right into the, the one lane that is northbound on River Road now. The real issue is, is to, I can see what the issue is that you're saying is to cars that are coming past it, you don't want them, them get the right. hung up. And what we've done is provide a site distance exhibit to show that, that there isn't that a problem for making the left turn. Access. You may have to wait because it's got it, got busy, it. but you're gonna hopefully be able to make a, a right. safe I understand, turn. thank you very much. Very good. Any further questions? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph Ackerman. No comment. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> Help build our audience. Uh, Pete Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this evening. The um, Could you say I, your I'm name? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Pete Boyce. I live at 3995 Tayside. It's uh, the one right on the corner there, 13800. Ah, OK. So I have a lot of experience with Tayside. And both uh, Mr. Green and gentleman from AKS uh, did uh, outline a lot of those concerns. That intersection where Tayside meets River Road is a, already a dangerous intersection. There's no question about it. I deal with it every day. The cars coming east from uh, outside the city limits, uh, I know the speed limit's 45 miles an hour, but, but they're not 60 miles an hour is not uncommon. So uh, you need a, a, a lot of sight distance. And that road is curved both on both sides, so it's hard coming out. The, uh, there are three access points into Bailey Ridge uh, slash uh, uh, Club uh, Illahi. And um, the, uh, the, the distance between those roads, between Tayside and Rogue and Rogue and Country Club is quite substantial. This is, what, less than 200 yards between the proposed uh, Street A and uh, Tayside. Um, so th that concerns me because they're so close and uh, it's going to create, uh, make Tayside even more, a more dangerous intersection and the same with, with Street A local, that will be uh, equally dangerous. Um, so uh, my, that, that's, that's my major concern and it has been expressed. I would request that if in fact this is approved, two things be done. One, the speed limit along that road probably ought to be about 35 miles an hour, right from the city limits all the way in. Uh, you can, we can access Country Club, and the speed limit at Country Club is 35 miles an hour. And so that's often what I do. I, I go around. But the people, if I'm, if, unless I'm misunderstanding uh, the way this will be developed, people in phase one will only have egress onto River Road until phase two is completed. I know the right-of-way is going to be accessed, but I, I think another requirement of this approval ought to be that they 
build Street A to Firth and Firth uh, all the way to Tayside. That way the people in phase one will have options in terms of their egress. I think it would be much safer if they did, did it that way. So I would, I would uh, ask the city council to uh, make that a, uh, a, a requisite of this, uh, this proposal. Any questions for, for Mr. Uh, Boyce? All righty, that's uh, the only folks I have signed up. Is there anyone else who wanted to testify on this public hearing? Okay. Yeah, can have the chance for rebuttal. Did you want to rebut? So I, I just quickly say again, Joey Shear, AKS Engineering, um, for, for the record, um, that the proximity, the, the site has been designed so that the, the distance between those two access points is as far away as possible, the greatest distance between them. Um, that distance meets all the city's applicable requirements for uh, access spacing. Uh, I, I don't think that um, the, the property owner, the applicant, would, would uh, object to a, a lower speed limit if the, okay. the city deemed that as a, a, a safety improvement. Um, but I'd also say that the, the phasing and the staggering of infrastructure kind of go hand in hand. Um, we would <coughs> clearly object to the idea of building the entire uh, infrastructure for the project uh, only with phase one. Uh, I, I don't think that that's something that the city can re require, um, but it would be built in conjunction with phase two at some point in the future. Um, if and when phase, phase two actually develops. Okay, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I, I have a question about that, and as I saw, read it and saw your aerial map there, there is a house where phase two is now. No. So no. that house will not be there if phase two is completely developed out. Correct. So the problem, another problem with building the street A all the way through to connect the Tayside is it would run through the property or the very close to the house that is currently there. That's correct. So I would guess that there is a possibility that phase two is never going to happen. Yes, that's true. And that's true with basically any subdivision that's approved by, by the city. Well, isn't it a little more true when there's already a house there uh, that's a pretty substantial home from the way it looks? Yes. I mean, that, that is true, but substantively, that doesn't really have any... Right, I understand that. So, with the criteria. so if phase one were built, or phase two were built first, would that have to have access onto River Road, or could you get access to that from Tayside as opposed to building Street A all the way down to River Road? Um... I guess either one would be possible. Yeah. It would be, be, depend on what was um, so, applied so, for. So theoretically, you might not need the, sec the street A to go to River Road if you were to come in through Tayside, go around that way, and then have the cul-de-sac in phase one just end there. Theoretically. OK, thank you. Councilor McCoy. Um, I drive that a lot too. I have my uh, grandkids that live in Monmouth and I go to football, basketball, baseball, anything else they do are. there all the time. <laughs> my question is, um, what if, if, if the speed limit was 55 there, what would the sight lines be? It's a calculation based on the AASHTO standards and I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, well I'm guessing that's 25% faster than 45, so would it, I mean it'd be long, would it, because you got a curve in that road, and you got the, I don't know, the city limits are right around that curve, aren't they? As I recall. You're coming down and around, and you hit the city Further limits, west. and then you start, yeah. Um, anyway, because I agree, the, the folks don't go 45 through there. They go, they're flying through there. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I got guys coming right up on me when I come into town to slow down. They're hauling through there. So I, that's, to me, some some concern, because... That my sight line might be for 45, but I'm going to tell you right now, they're going faster in that, so it might not be adequate. That's the reason for my question. Councilor Hoy. 
What is the distance from Street A to Tayside? I think it's roughly 370 ish feet. Cook, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Perry. Yeah, I wanted to thank you for coming down tonight. And part of the reason, part of the reason that I pulled this, and I'm really glad we did the pedestrian study today. Um, I know you're only required to do the sidewalks on one side. We've talked about that, and that's the current standard and current requirement. Uh, my question is, you've got 11 units. <laughs> and this 11 keeps coming around. If there were 12 units, would there be a different standard that you would be held to? Does it trigger some other kind of traffic study in some way? I don't believe way? so. No, I mean, staff can answer that, but I don't believe so. Uh, no. no. So since this is a 20 unit total, you're just breaking it into 11 and then nine. It's, it's a logical break between basically the current undeveloped portion of the property and what could be future development um, if the existing home was torn down. And then there are 17 conditions mm -hmm. on this particular um, case. I noticed there was a lot of mention of construction hours and concern on that as well. Is that something that you've discussed as far as something that's come up? Um, no, that hasn't been hasn't been discussed. I don't know that there are any applicable requirements around that. Okay. All right, and I guess my additional questions will be for staff, so thank you. Okay. Oh. Councilor McCoy. Uh, one more question. There's a couple of conditions that require geotechnical studies, or is that a, is it sloped? Is there a reason that there's a concern with the geotechnical studies uh, for those lots? No, generally that's required for infiltration, make sure that stormwater um, okay. can be detained and treated. On site. Okay. Councillor Lewis. Can you bring back the slide that shows the existing residents? Uh, I don't know that that was in my presentation. Okay. Then let me just ask a general question. Is it situated that it could be incorporated into phase two? It's a really big house. Um, I, I don't believe so, no. Any further questions? All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your time. Any questions for staff? Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, excellent job, Mr. Green. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a few questions. How many times has River Road been blocked, either because of traffic uh, trucks going under the bridge and getting stuck or because of landslide issues? Um, I'm I'm not sure. That's not something we looked Within at. Within this that. last year, do we have a number of times that River Road's been? We have uh, staff from Public Works that may be able to answer that. Thank you. Yeah, Councilor. Uh, periodically, there are issues with truckers that use their GPS and get stuck under the railroad and the county section of River sure. Road. Mm -hmm. uh, that then blocks, you know, access from the south. There are other cross streets. I'm not sure if there are other connections. Uh, headed north, uh, we do have landslide issues as we get uh, closer to, to Owens, uh, but there are other access points uh, such as Madrona and or uh, Croyson Creek I'm, Road, et cetera. I'm so there's other ways through. So glad you brought that up because uh, the detour route would in fact be through Madrona. Is that correct? Uh, I think there's other streets, but that would be that would be a a connection. Yes. And there, Madrona is now slated for traffic improvements or sidewalk improvements or traffic calming. I'm sorry, I can't see you because Councilor Lewis is head. <laughs> um, currently, are there people requesting traffic calming measures on Madrona that we haven't been able to address as of yet because of budget? Well, Madrona is an arterial, so, so I don't know that we would do anything other than, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's not eligible for for any kind of traffic calming per se. I, th I think I've seen some issues on some of the cross streets uh, in that neighborhood. Uh, I, think the, I think the neighbors are, are expressing some concerns there. Okay. All right, I, I just find it timely since we had our pedestrian study today and we're talking about sidewalks and a contiguous network and we've got sidewalks, but to where? 
These are um, 11 units, possibly 20. How are these people that live there going to get where they're going to go? And if it's on River Road, I've been on River Road as well, and it just took a few times being on a run there and coming across roadkill um, to convince me to not go that way anymore. So um, I just want to take a look at that. There's no requirements for crossing, no requirements for pedestrian medians, no requirements for uh, lowering speed limits at this time, and I called it up so we could kind of gauge this with fresh eyes given the, the pedestrian study that we just saw. We have new information. It takes all of us working together. Planning and land use are a big part of this. And this has gone through the planning commission. Do you want but to I, use this for a question or a debate? Sorry. Pick one. Thank you. OK. <laughs> Councilor Case. Thank you. I'm just curious, what if phase two is not built? I know that each uh, subdivision has to be a phase, they're self-contained, all of that, but it's completely within their right within law to not do that if they choose to not do that. Is that correct? That's correct, so, and that's similar to unfazed subdivision can not just not be platted um, or phases of uh, phase subdivisions are allowed to or not be platted. And is there a, a timeline on that? Like they have to file and then they have so much time to actually do it, is my understanding. Correct. Okay. Um, from the tentative approval, um, they have uh, two years to plat phase one. Um, that can be extended in two year increments up to four times. And then in general for phase subdivisions, all future phases beyond the first one, so just two in this case, uh, phase two would have 10 years. Okay, and they do have to do them in order? <laughs> yes. Phase one, phase two? Okay, thanks. Councilor Anderson. Thank you. Following up on that, that's 10 years plus 10 years then? I'm sorry, so. 10 years for phase one if you get. If potentially you get, 10 years for phase and one. And then 10 years for phase two. Yeah. They could also both be platted all at once. Sure, that's, sure. Yeah. Well, if they were going to be platted all at once, we wouldn't have two phases. We just have one project. Um, my question is. Um, Uh, first, a specific one. We heard the, I think there, uh, Mr. Uh, Boyce testified as to where he lives. Is there um, a sidewalk already in front of that area? So by putting the sidewalk and the improvements uh, uh, in phase one, we are starting sort of a link of sidewalks on the North River Road? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, for so the, the sidewalk Ridge, ends right there, Shell Silverstein right would say. Yeah. Okay. Then my other question is, and I don't know, Mr. Green, if you can answer this, and I'm looking at Mr. Wright. <laughs> 17 conditions on a development. I mean, that seems like a lot. And um, it seems to me the more conditions you get, the more problematic the subdivision was to start with. Um, you may want to defer that to the boss here. I don't know. I, I would point out on this one there are some of the conditions are sort of broken up because the, they could be implemented in phases. Um, some of them are things like 10-foot um, public utility easement along frontages that PGE and other utility providers um, like. So that some of them are fairly um, innocuous. Innocuous is probably a good word, yeah. It, it just seems unusual to see that many conditions on a subdivision. I, I can't speak to the uh, to the uh, normalcy of 17 conditions for uh, a subdivision, as this is my first one to review in a public hearing here. But uh, as just a, a, a standard practice from other places, 17 is not uncommon, particularly when you consider the perfunctory conditions that relate to utilities and, uh, and particularly uh, anything that involves multiple requests as this does, such as, for example, the, the approval requested for the subdivision itself, as well as the expansion uh, as it relates to the urban growth boundary. So, so that's not uncommon, at least from my experience elsewhere. Councilor McCoy. Um, it references Bailey Ridge reimbursement district fee. What, what is the reimbursement district funding? Out of curiosity. Yeah, so I, uh, uh, Bailey Ridge, I believe, built uh, the wa a water line. 
uh, to that area that is subject to a reimbursement district that council adopted many years ago. So they they would owe Bailey Ridge some money as a, it's a latecomer fee. Okay, and I believe it's the water line. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, sewer? Um, sewer. I'm sewer? sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, you, it was one of the two, right? Yeah. Uh, one other question. Uh, you know, th uh, the, uh, Mr. Boyle referenced maybe changing that speed limit as it, uh, you come into the city limits from 45 to 35. Who has to do that? I mean, I've asked once in one of my wards, and it was a state. Right. Is it the state here? Still or is. is. It so, so we would need to. So, is this area urbanizes like this? I think it is appropriate to make the request, uh, and uh, uh, and do the study uh, as an anticipation. Bailey Ridge was an anticipation of, uh, of of development. If this is adopted, uh, uh, I think I think we would want to. Uh, go back to this do the analysis and go to the state and make the request to lower the speed limit okay so uh, out of curiosity can we make that another condition um i i guess or i defer to the city attorney i i would my recommendation would be not to make it a condition but to make it a request or make it a uh a uh, uh the, re the request would come from the city not from the applicants right it's not really well proper we would be requesting i'm just saying ourselves. i would like him to do that request that the speed oh. limit go from 45 to 35 when you enter the city limits again that there wouldn't be a condition you put on the decision it's something you direct staff to do okay right. cool do i do that later <laughs> <or not? laughs> Thanks, i like Dwight. doing that <laughs> okay any further questions councilor cook would you like to make a motion uh thank you mr mayor yes i'd like to oh, i'm gonna close the just a minute close the hearing Thanks. Thank you. Uh, That's okay. Yes, I would like to make a motion that we close. Oh, you've already closed the hearing. Yep. I would like to make a motion move to staff recommendation. Second. Second by McCoy. Who? By Lewis. By Lewis. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go and ahead. then do I speak Yeah, to you it? discuss okay. your motion. All right, thank you. Um, I really wanted to pull this up because I feel like it brings up a lot of the issues of uh, transportation and land use development in a really poignant way since we just had this traffic study. Where are the people, how are they going to get to school, the people that live there? How are they going to get to work? We have no transit stops. We have no crosswalks. It's a 45 mile an hour road with a curve where people go 60. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions that are being made and, and we're meeting the current guidelines. When I talked with Councillor McCoy about this last night, it was, but these meet all the standards. They meet all the standards. But the standards are changing and we know more information now. And we want to make sure that we, especially if this division, subdivision can take 20 years for approval, we're not putting something in that will tie the hands or make this place not livable in the future. All righty. Any further discussion, Councillor Anderson? This is more in the nature of a comment, and one, but it is discussion. When I was looking at the aerial map, uh, you could see to the right of the aerial map or toward town, it's all developed subdivisions. The, the property we have to the west of that property and to the north of that property are the five acre lots with one house on it. And what I see is gonna happen here on River Road is the lot immediately to the other side of it is gonna be developed. Then the lot to the other side of that is gonna be developed. Then somebody's gonna want some sort of easement to go up to the lots on the north of that to develop. And pretty soon we're gonna have a whole lot of people there. Absolutely. And that, uh, uh, that is not something we should consider in this particular subdivision, but I'm saying that this is a problem that is going to come up and that is going to increase the, prop, the, the uh, uh, traffic on River Road to a great extent and will uh, increase the concerns that Councillor Cook had. So I think that uh, it might behoove the city with Plan, uh, with respect to planning on River Road, I think you're going to have to look out in the future and think in the next 10 years to 15 years to 20 years, there's going to be a whole lot of those 20 lot subdivisions where there now is 10 or 12 single families there. There's going to be 10 or 12 times 20 homes there, all of with which will need things, and that's going to really affect uh, the development of River Road. Yeah. 
It's really kind of the impact of infill, of a yeah. policy of infill, isn't it? Well, well this, this isn't really infill. This is extending to the urban growth boundary, I think, is kind of more what it is because Currently there's nothing built out, though, in five-acre yeah. yeah. lots. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I'm saying that that's consistent with what the planning is. It's yeah. just now <laughs> we've got to look at it and say, okay, we've got to do something about River Road. Yeah. Councilor Hoy. I want to concur with my colleagues from Wards 2 and 7. I agree with that completely. And also, uh, Councilor McCoy, I, want to, I would like the city to request that to review of the speed limit on River Road. Okay. Any, yes, Councilor Kayser. I want to say that I, I agree with that. Um, I also just wanted to, to comment that when these kind of, I guess, one-off, you could say, you know, these five-acre lots now getting subdivided, if we're not careful, we're going to end up with a patchwork of interesting residential areas. And, and one of the things that I think really is detrimental to building community is our cul-de-sacs. And if you go into these areas and everything's a cul-de-sac and you have no connections to other existing areas of residences, that's, that's, that's a problem. So we need to be mindful of that as well. Okay. well good discussion. Any further discussion on this. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion passes. Councillor McCoy, did you have an additional instruction for the staff? Here? We can move Perhaps. forward on that um, recommendation well, just, without uh, council taking formal action. Okay, great. Okay, we'll go to special orders of business. These are appointments. Yeah, these are uh, a series of announcements on appointments. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Okay, we'll go to that's 5A and 5B. Yes, yeah, I'll go to 5C. Um, I move the City Council create a four member council task force to evaluate options for reducing traffic congestion and improving vehicular mobility around the Marion and Center Street bridges. I further move that City Council direct the City Manager to fund the task force's activities and designate Public Works Department staff to support the task force with data collection and analysis and contract consultant assistance. Second. Second by Anderson. Uh, this is uh, a motion I'm bringing after uh, a series of discussions I've been having with counselors uh, uh, with the uh, realization I think we all have. Uh, we've spent 10 years developing uh, the environmental impact statement. Uh, it remains controversial. It may, remains unresolved. If it were approved tomorrow, which in my opinion it should be, but it probably won't, um, it would be 10 more years of uh, determining the scope, the design, the funding, and the construction of another bridge. Uh, I have felt for some time that the correct uh, action by the City Council in the face of what is a 20-year-long process is to make sure we have absolutely maximized the use of the Marion and Center Street bridges. Uh, I don't think uh, we know if those are being maximized. We have a number of studies that show different uh, pieces of the picture. Uh, in this case, though, we have the opportunity going on as well for ODOT to be studying the um, seismic condition, particularly of the Center Street Bridge and what needs to be done there to make that seismically sound, which allows us to look at the lane configuration on the Center Street Bridge and determine that there is a structural the structural support for that. So I think it's a real opportunity uh, to move forward on this. And I think uh, also uh, to really d uh, take a look at one of the alternatives uh, that was, I, I think, uh, popular uh, during discussion of the EIS alternatives, which was maximizing the use of the existing bridges. And there's certainly nothing wrong with doing that anyway. Uh, in fact, it kind of doesn't make sense not to maximize those. So I'd ask you to approve this uh, this motion. Uh, there's a batch of uh, additional information on the scope of work uh, being talked about, but uh, I think this is a, 
a, a real good place for us to spend time. Uh, we've got, we know one of, that there is just an ongoing congestion problem downtown and congestion problem in West Salem and that traffic flow is not working and it is one of the several issues including regional economic future and others that uh, weigh heavily on the discussion of the third bridge. So let's at least deal with some of the congestion issues. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Um, since my time on council, oh, I support the motion, obviously I made the second, but since my time on council and before, uh, I've advocated that what we need to do is fix and maintain uh, and improve what we have now and we need to deal with it now in the immediate future, we can deal with traffic congestion by looking at these uh, now. And this is the way to go about it. Uh, it should have been done a long time ago, but it's good that we're doing it now. And I uh, would echo the mayor, there are plenty of studies out there that have been done. 1997, 1998 Willamette River Bridgehead Engineering Study, which had recommendations. There's alternative 2A to the Salem River Crossing uh, Project Draft Environmental EIS Statement, which the mayor also talked about. There's the 2010 alternate mode studies, and there are other studies, uh, including some potential for park and ride that have been there. Um, we just two meetings ago or three meetings ago uh, approved a um, MOU with the uh, ODOT to study seismic retrofitting and of, of the bridge. As part of that now, we are also, we have also, the city will be looking at the two-way traffic study, what happens in emergencies where we can run two-way traffic on one or both of the bridges. Uh, we've also are now have the MOU agreement with ODOT will include um, what to do about the fifth lane on Center Street Bridge, which is now a ped bike um, uh, lane or uh, that could be made to a, another lane. Um, with respect to the scope of the work, I think the study area should be loose enough to include roads that lead into the study area itself. For example, on the north, on both sides of the river, right now uh, the scope is, says Union Road and Orchard Heights. I think those might be a little too restrictive. Uh, perhaps we might want to look at Division, which is basically where the new police station will be south. Uh, and then also, um, uh, we need to look at, I think, with respect to the Orchard Heights on the west side, with whatever happens to Marine Drive, because that, that is coming in, potentially it could come in right there, and that's also something, the whole purpose of Marine Drive uh, originally was to uh, um, ease traffic congestion on, on Wallace Road. Um, I also think uh, there should be uh, um, uh, uh, focus on bicycle pedestrian issues too and it's mentioned in there but I think that's another thing to study and finally I think that this proposal really has nothing to do with any environmental impact statement I think what we're doing here is a separate um, separate project that, that needs to happen right now because the, the goal here is to improve the traffic flow and to decrease congestion on both sides of the river and I think there's a lot of ways out there that this committee uh, with the help of the staff and per perhaps a consultant will be able to come up with this and give a recommendation that we can start to move on these things immediately. So I support the motion. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank you for the work you've done on this and your leadership on this issue. I'm really looking forward to this uh, committee going forward. I think that you know we have a peak hour traffic congestion problem. There's no doubt about it. We need to make some real progress on that now, not in 20 years. And I really uh, think that this is a great project. I think this is the time to get it done, and I'm, I'm thankful for you bringing this forward. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Lewis. Um, I agree with uh, with Councillor Anderson. I think that this is uh, well overdue, um, and I, I believe there are going to be things that we can look seriously at that could affect congestion where it's at its worst. I can think of something in West Salem that, um, at, as you come off the bridge, you, there's an existing street called Musgrave, and you could take Musgrave all the way to Glen Creek if we simply would lift up one bar. Now, whether we want to go through the center of a park or not, that's another issue to talk about. 
the other thing I want to mention is I see this as timely and important, but I don't see this as a substitution for the Salem River crossing. I've been working on that aspect of our transportation system for almost 10 years now, and the need is greater today than it ever was. Um, but it does take time. It does take a lot of time to get something like that done, and this makes sense to do something that can alleviate and help us in the meantime. Councilor Kayser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, to echo uh, Councilor Hoy, thank you again for bringing this forward. Um, I enthusiastically support it. Um, I think this is a good um, kind of thing we can do right now to help folks right now on both sides of the river. Um, and I think it's something that everybody can get behind and agree that's that's needed. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, six months from now, the outcomes and <laughs> what we get to do. Exactly. Very good. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion passes. And we go to information reports. Councilor Cook, I'm going to call on you first in case you want to make a motion. Just pick one then. Pick yours. Are we already doing six Go ahead. They're information reports. People can bring up comments. I'm just going to give you a chance to make your motion now. For 6C? Or do yeah. I? Six, yeah. So we're just skipping over 6A and 6B? No. You're just going to get a chance to go first. Well, that is exciting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey. <laughs> as soon as I think I get the process I'm down. Just kind of a surprise for you. All right. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, I would like to call item 6C up for a hearing. Second. Second by McCoy. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Motion. Oop. No. <laughs> motion passes. Lewis is a no. Okay. Anyone want to talk about 6A, 6B, 6D? I have a question on 6A. 6A, yeah. Um, so I didn't see a recommendation from the Public uh, Library Advisory Board. Was this taken in front of the Salem Public? Library Advisory Board? No, just recommended from admin at this point. Just out of curiosity. Yes, uh, this was not taken forward to my knowledge to the Advisory Board. This okay. was uh, uh, actually a reflection of current practices already in place at the library and this formalizes those actions uh, for the sake of staff. Sure, um, and no problem. I understand as a library patron and as someone with young kids why those are there. Uh, it's just I am looking for those advisory board recommendations when these things come before council. So I'm always curious when they're not there, what the reason is. Very well said. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All righty. Any other action on these information reports? All right. We'll go to uh, first reading of ordinances. That makes sense. Ordinance Bill number 2417, an ordinance declaring certain territory located at 4932 Swiegel Road Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Marion County Fire District number one and the East Salem Sewer and Drainage District. Councilor Hoy. I move staff recommendation. Second. Second by McCoy. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Second reading. Ordinance Bill number 2317, an ordinance relating to a change to the Salem Area Comprehensive Plan Map designation for 1332 and 1334 Wallace Road Northwest. Councillor Anderson, excuse me, Councillor Kayser. Yes. Councillor Anderson. Yes. Councillor Nakey is absent. Councillor McCoy. I guess yes is what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Osick. Yes. Aye. <laughs> Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Cook? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. And Mayor Bennett? Aye. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Motion passes. Well, is and is there anyone else that wanted to comment <laughs> to the council at all? Okay. Then we are adjourned. <laughs>